Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to New America. It is so wonderful to see everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So we have a, a really exciting uh, jam-packed event uh, today talking about some very important, uh, some important issues. We're going to hear some new research and we're going to have some fantastic conversations with thought leaders, practitioners, and policy experts in the field about getting non-degree community colleges right, uh, centering quality and workforce education. So. My name is Mary Alice McCarthy, and I'm a senior director here at New America, and I oversee our Center on Education and Labor. Um, before I, I want to just share a few thank yous and a few remarks before we dive into to today's discussion. So let me just start with the thank yous. First, again, thanks to all of you who've made it here this morning. Uh, we're just getting started. Uh, this is about our th fourth or fifth in-person event so far since uh, March of 2020. So we're just thrilled that you're able to join us. Thank you very much. And to all of you who are joining us online, uh, thank you very much. We had over 400 registrations for our, uh, the online event. We're absolutely thrilled. Um, so uh, we do look forward to hearing from you in the question and answer period. So I hope um, that you'll, you'll get some prompts about how to participate in that. But again, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, next thank you is to our funder, Lumina Foundation, uh, that was, has generally, generously supported this two-year project, which then turned into a three-year sprint. And this is like <laughs> pandemic time, where like nothing actually quite adds up. So again, thanks to our program officers, Kermit Kaliba and Georgia Bullen, who have just been fantastic thought partners in this whole process and helped us sort of adapt to the differing, uh, uh, different moments and opportunities um, um, for working with the colleges. We did two rounds of this uh, research project, and it was really great to be able to work with them on um, sort of taking some lessons from the first round and then also adapting to the different circumstances in which the second round took place. So thanks again for that. Um, while everyone's here too, I do want to take this moment to sort of acknowledge the tremendous leadership of Iris Palmer, who leads our community college program here at uh, New America and who was the lead on this project. And again, who steered this very complicated project through, uh, you know, a, a, an incredibly challenging time. So thank you, Iris. Uh, you'll be hearing from her. And to Shailen Jotishi, our lead researcher on this project and lead writer who has been a tireless uh, writer and researcher and uh, uh, has learned, has helped us all learn so much about these, these projects. And thanks to all of the New America team that, that helped and went on some of the site visits um, and, uh, and to our comms team that has helped us get the word out and is helping us here today. So, all right. Well, so we're here today to talk about workforce education programs, particularly non-degree programs. This is the area of focus of this two slash three year research project. So first, just a couple of quick points of why non-degree education? Why are we so focused on that? And I think probably if you're here, you already know the answer to that. But uh, we, uh, in this country, we have a, a widening opportunity gap between those with a bachelor's degree and those without a bachelor's degree. Right? And uh, the bachelor's degree has become an increasingly stark dividing line in our labor market. Um, and it has actually become sort of a choke point, really, uh, in, um, in both uh, economic mobility for individuals, but also in economic development and innovation for employers. Um, so this is the system in which we generate uh, um, in which uh, bachelor's degrees are increasingly becoming uh, required for jobs and then jobs that do not require a bachelor's degree do not offer the same, uh, sometimes the same paying benefits as jobs that do. It's just unsustainable for our country, it's unsustainable for our communities, and I think it's unsustainable for, for our employers as well. So it's not that, and it's not that we don't like bachelor's degrees. Of course, one of the solutions to this widening opportunity gap between those with a college degree and those without is to make higher education, bachelor's degree education in particular, more affordable and more accessible, and we're all in favor of that. But that on itself is just not going to be enough. And it's actually not going to address some of the really critical pain points that we're seeing in our economy and in our labor market in terms of the shortages of, of, of jobs that, that are there and the shortages of workers. So we know that we need more alternatives, more alternative pathways into good jobs and into a stable middle class life that do not have to go through a two or four year degree. Um, these, these opportunities can certainly connect to those degrees, but people need to be able to start their careers uh, and start earning family sustaining wages earlier than that. And, um, and it's just absolutely critically important that we do so. So this is not new either, and we actually kicked off this project in 2019, and, and even then, you know, non-credits, non non-degree workforce education is not a new topic, right? It's been around for quite a while, but it has um, taken on increased urgency, I think, as inequality has been widening, and it's also um, 
taken, taken on increased urgency as we try to address some of the unique challenges that, and, and unique opportunities, which I'll talk about in a minute, that we're facing in the future. Um, but one of the things that we've always known about non-degree edu workforce education at community colleges and more broadly is that the problem we're facing isn't a, the, a, you know, a, a, the quantity of programs. There is plenty of non-degree, non-credit workforce education programs out there. In fact, you won't have to look very far. You don't have to spend much time on the internet or really go anywhere without seeing some sort of offerings of a training program that will get people connected, to, uh, that will connect you to a job and do it quickly. But there has been a shortage, and, and there's no real problem of access to those programs, right? They are ubiquitous, they are everywhere. Um, but there is a shortage of high quality programs. There are not nearly as many high quality non-degree programs, and we'll talk about what quality means in a minute, there's, but there are fewer of those. And access to those high quality non-degree programs is much more uh, restricted. Right? So just an example of this sort of conundrum that we're in. Um, I think we all know that the skilled trades and manufacturing you know, tra have training programs, have long-standing sort of traditions of being able to train people into uh, really good jobs that pay very well, um, um, mid certainly middle class and above um, lifestyles. Um, but access to those training programs has been very, uh, has not been very open, and particularly for women and particularly for black men. So we have a high quality example of a non-degree program with very limited access. At the flip end of the, of the space, we have uh, non-degree programs in fields where demand is absolutely exploding. There are huge shortages in our care sector, child care workers, long-term care workers, and also in areas like hospitality and, uh, and, and in some cases retail. And so there are tremendous, there, there's, there's huge demand for these programs, but the jobs that are connected to them are not the kind of high quality jobs that I just talked about in, skilled, in the skilled trades and manufacturing. Right? These are not always jobs that pay a family sustaining wage. So it was, we took on this project, um, and thank you to Lumina Foundation again for, for, for letting us dig into this. What we really wanted to do uh, was to Understand, identify, analyze, and understand the characteristics of those really high quality programs that both are, you know, connect people to very good jobs, actually get them into those jobs, and that they are good jobs, and that, are, and that also maintain broad accessibility to those jobs. And so we spent three years looking for those programs and looking for the colleges that do them, and we found many, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, and you're gonna hear about those specific programs and those institutions. But just, I think what we need, what, as we're sort of coming to the end of our research, what we want to understand too is then what does this mean? Why is it so hard to do high quality non-degree programs? It's not because colleges don't want to, right? That is for sure. Uh, so what makes these so hard? And you'll be hearing a little bit about the, the, our research on that and about policy misalignment and funding strategies that make it hard for colleges to pay for the things that they need to to really stand up high quality programs. Um, some of it is just capacity. Community colleges are under, are, are, um, under so much strain and everybody wants them to do everything these days and uh, they're getting pulled in a lot of directions. So again, just how do, they, how do they maintain the staff and the expertise they need to be able to do these programs well? And then last of all though is that a big challenge for colleges is that they don't control the labor market, right? And they don't control the fact that some of these jobs that are extremely important to our economy, right, and are facing acute shortages don't pay well. So this question of what does it mean for community colleges to deliver high quality non-degree programs and occupations that are not well paid, I think is gonna be one of the major challenges facing the field going forward. How can community colleges partner with external, uh, with other organizations, with state agencies, with local agencies around these questions? Because um, I don't think it's for lack of wanting to be able to improve the quality of those jobs. And how do we align our funding strategies that allows uh, that puts community colleges at the table of those job quality discussions and allows them to be a, a full partner in those. So before I, um, so, so we're gonna share some examples of all of that today. And I say, um, I come away from this research so encouraged about uh, where we are on non-degree education and how far we've come. Um, and it's a good thing because um, we are at a really, I think, important historic moment uh, uh, in terms of workforce development uh, in this country and, and the opportunities for non-degree education programs. When we started this project in 2019, um, 
economy was, you know, in macro terms, in, in quite good shape, right? Unemployment was extremely low. Um, there were a lot of shortages, uh, skill shortages. Employers were, were, you know, looking hard for talent. So it was a really good time to be able to dig into these issues. Then we went through just wild gyrations of unemployment and underemployment and non-employment. And then here we are three years later, and we're back to almost the exact same economy with two gigantic exceptions, one being inflation, um, which is hopefully a temporary exception. But the other big ex exception is that we now have $4 trillion of investments in infrastructure and a broad array of infrastructure from bridges and roads, but also to broadband, to green energy. Right? And those, inf those investments are going to generate a lot of new jobs. And a lot of those jobs are not going to or should not require a four-year degree to enter. So there's a tremendous opportunity ahead of us and almost uh, an obligation to make sure, and we feel that obligation, to make sure that what we've been learning is able to translate into how some of those uh, uh, investments are implemented and to put community colleges at the table uh, on making sure that those uh, non-degree pro training programs for those good jobs are, are really high quality. So we're excited about that. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, introduce our first speaker of the day. It is a tremendous privilege and honor to introduce Chauncey Lennon, the Vice President for Work and Learning at Lumina Foundation. Um, uh, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to work with Chauncey, I'm sorry, because it, it is delightful. He has tremendous experience in workforce development, policy, and practice. Uh, he currently sits on the New York City Workforce Development Board, so he's walking the walk and talking the talk at the same time, and that's a bird's eye view. Uh, before joining Lumina Foundation, Chauncey was the Managing Director of Workforce Development at the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and then also spent time at the Ford Foundation as a program officer. Um, but what you might not know about Chauncey, which I think is fascinating and exciting, is that he is also an anthropologist by training. He has a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University. And when I think back, Chauncey, to 2019, when I will say, full credit, thank you to Chauncey, this project was his idea. And he said to us, he came to us after we, uh, at an event held in this space uh, about our tax investment, it was like, what would it be like if you went out into the field and like found some quality programs, learned about them, wrote about them, and tried to figure it out, you know, back map the policy? Uh, from that, what, what would that, could you do that? You know, and so we thought a lot about that. And I thought to myself as I read that, um, I was reminded that he was an anthropologist. I was like, that's how anthropologists work. <laughs> oh my gosh. So one thing, Chauncey, is I think a lot of anthropology graduate students right now would like to know about the career path that led you <laughs> from a PhD in anthropology to J.P. Morgan Chase Bank to Lumina Foundation. But more importantly, thank you for supporting that kind of really important research. That is the best way. Uh, we, that's how we love to do things, be on the field, um, talk to people, learn from uh, the experts in the field, and then try to see how we can uh, hopefully advocate for policies that uh, allow them to, to fulfill their aspirations uh, uh, for high quality non-degree education. So with that, let me introduce Chauncey Lennon. Thank you, Mary Alice, for those kind words. Um, I do try to keep it very quiet that I have a PhD in anthropology, so you all are now in on the secret, but don't tell anyone else. Um, let me uh, welcome everyone here um, and people who are joining us uh, remotely. Um, let me add my thanks uh, to Shailen, uh, to Iris, to Mary Alice, to everyone uh, at New America who helped make this project the success uh, that it was. And I want to also say thanks to the community colleges and the community college students who, without uh, their work on this incredibly important uh, set of, 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 of training and education activities, uh, we wouldn't have any story to tell. Um, and you know, we really are doing this in service of making the opportunities, uh, the support, and the recognition they deserve uh, better. Um, so I, uh, I also want to thank, we had an advisory committee too that also was folks from the community college field that were also very helpful to this work. Um, I want to sort of go back a little bit in time too and, and think about, you know, why, why, is, uh, why is this issue important? Uh, and I, I, I don't have slides, but I'm going to use my hands as graphics and we'll see how that goes. Um, but, you know, the way I like to think about this is it's important to think about uh, our, our general demographics. And if we go back to the 1960s, uh, demographers call uh, our demography, it was a demographic pyramid, and it was a pyramid. And the importance of a pyramid was that to feed a growing economy, we had lots of young people, folks down here in the corners, who were going to get older, 
we were going to educate and train them, and they were going to go into the economy, not just replace the old people, but we had more of them, we could grow the workforce. Um, we also had other things like immigration, improvements to productivity, um, and that's how we did it, right? That's how we, we, we sort of built our economy. What do we have today? We have no more pyramid. We have a beehive. There are no more young people, right? We have no more, or no more excess young people. Um, now that is important. That means we really have to ensure that we live in a world where every young person is getting educated and trained. Um, but it's not just that we have no more young people. We don't really have any more immigrants, and we aren't doing so well in productivity. So what that means is we have decided, perhaps not intentionally, that we are going to grow and sustain our economy on adults, people in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s. And they all are going to need to be retrained, upskilled, skilled for the first time, whatever the case may be. And that is where we are. We, we don't talk about it in these terms, but we are now facing a world in which uh, the, the greatest demand for us to sustain our economy is going to be educating adults. Let me sort of talk about this from another set of numbers. So um, over the next decade, we're going to graduate about 35 million young people from high school. And again, all of them need to get training post high school to go into the labor market. That's really important. That will not be enough by any measure. We currently have 39 million adults with some college no credential and over 50 million adults whose highest uh, level of education is a high school diploma. That is where the lion's share of our workforce is going to come from, right? Many of them are already in the workforce, but they need another dose of skills. Some of those skills will turn out into credentials, but some of those skills will come in two or three classes at a community college. The reality is we have to understand that the impetus is as honest now to figure out how do we do that better, right? And to Mary Alice's point, um, uh, we're not starting from zero, right? This is not a new world. Um, Community colleges have long uh, been involved in training adults, incumbent workers. We have lots of labels for it. It's contract training. We, we, we have been, this is part of what was behind the development of community colleges 50 plus years ago. Um, but uh, we are now going to have to take that system designed for a very different era and ask it to figure out how to train tens of millions of adults, right? And they're going to be looking for programs that are affordable, flexible, tied to occupations. Um, and that is really, that is the challenge in front of us, is to think about how we're going to do that. Um, and you know, I think um, uh, we just don't know enough about how to do this, right? Uh, to Mary Alice's uh, story about uh, you know, this sort of our early thinking about this project, it was very much of kind of a positive deviance, right? We know that there are programs out there that are doing right by quality, that are doing right by equity, right? They are training uh, uh, folks who have been locked out of many industries because of gender, because of color, because of race. Uh, but we don't know enough of how that happened, right? And there is a story to be told. There's an institutional story, there's a financing story, there's a policy story, there's a leadership story, uh, and we better understand that story uh, because what we need to do uh, is that we need to think about uh, the challenge we face in terms of expanding the opportunity, expanding the high quality programs. We think about making these programs more equitable and we think about making these programs more sustainable because it's gonna take us a long time to get back to a world where we have lots of young people down in the corners of the pyramid. The, be the beehive is with us uh, for, for quite some time to come. So I see this project as a really critical first step of elevating this question and answering it in so many profound ways. And I couldn't be more excited about both the conversation today, uh, the, all the kind of incredible work that Shailen has done, keeping us up to date with blogs and reports. The three reports that you're sort of are being released today, really just important additions to our thinking about, uh, again, the policy dimension, the institutional dimension, the financing dimensions. So I'm thrilled to have you here with us, and I'm excited for the conversation. And perhaps most important, I look forward to all of us working together over the years to come uh, to continue to raise the importance uh, of this issue and to develop solutions. So thank you all.
great. Well, thanks very much, Chauncey, and, and just echoing Mary Alice, we're very grateful for your support and Lumina's support for this project. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Lumina Foundation's Kermit Kaliba and Georgia Reagan. Uh, very grateful for their support over the course of the project as well. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Shailen Jotishi. As Mary Alice mentioned, I'm a senior analyst for New America and a, a fellow at the World Economic Forum. And it's been my privilege to uh, co-author this work with my colleague uh, Iris Palmer, our deputy director, who you'll meet later in the program. Let me double check. Can everybody hear me with the microphone? It's all OK? Brilliant. Back up a bit. How's it now? Excellent. Great. Um, I know I look a lot different from my picture. Long hair, eye bags, the full enchilada. That's, that's, that's what the pandemic does for you. My glasses I left at home. Um, uh, but um, I wanted to just uh, say over the course of the program, both my email and Iris's email are included on the one pagers on all of your tables. So over the course of the program, please uh, tweet us and of course email us with your questions. And for those of you who are online, our contact info is on the website. And all of the Twitter handles for our speakers are also available on the event page. So please do engage with us so that we can connect with you after. Um, I have a brief presentation on our new models for a career preparation project before we dive into two really illustrious panel discussions. Um, today, Iris and I and our team are really excited to release three briefs that will, we hope will unlock the full potential of high-quality non-degree workforce education at community colleges in this country. Um, over the past several years, headline after headline has touted the promise of non-degree programs as faster, more affordable, or even more employer-aligned career preparation tools uh, compared to degrees. The US government and states like Maryland and many employers like Google and Microsoft and Apple have dropped degree requirements when hiring. And we know from public opinion data from Strata Education Network and other groups um, that have affirmed growing demand in non-degree paths that exceed demand for degrees. Uh, college enrollment is down. Skepticism of traditional paths is on the rise. Uh, and the picture is particularly bleak at community colleges. Um, and as we near a demographics cliff with the high school age population in particular in 2025, employers and colleges and learners alike are searching for new models for career preparation, as Mary Alice and Chauncey mentioned in their, their comments. The promise of non-degree programs are there, but as we've discussed, the reality is not living up to that promise, not yet. Uh, these programs could complement degrees, uh, and they could solve middle skill workforce needs uh, and kickstart a long-term educational journey for many millions of learners um, and also help them achieve the financial stability that they so need. Um, but earlier research from New America and others, including my venerable colleagues at the Non-Degree Credentials Research Network, also Lumina sponsored, uh, has revealed that even at public colleges, many non-degree programs lead to underemployment, unemployment, or employment in jobs that pay poverty wages with little ability to move out into higher level positions. So this initiative really at the core is, is tackling that question. Move my slide. So our new models research and storytelling initiative really sought to understand how to maximize the benefits of non-degree programs while mitigating the risks by unpacking the design, strategy, and financing principles that go into creating great non-degree programs at community colleges where many of these programs are offered and many of the most underserved black, Latinx, and indigenous students in this country get their education. Um, to set a scope on our program, this is a snapshot of non-degree programs offered by community colleges. As you can see, they're actually very diverse. They range from a one-week boot camp, by the way, not all boot camps are for coding, big misconception in the field, um, 
to multi-year apprenticeship programs. While no clear definition for non-degree programs exists, at least among colleges, uh, we decided to use this term non-degree programs because, as you can see, they are not all short-term. They are not all non-credit. They are not all alternative programs, as they're sometimes characterized as. And they don't necessarily all end in the credential. Chauncey mentioned sometimes it takes just a course or two to gain the skills you need. Um, and they're not even all necessarily awarded by colleges. Industry certifications, occupation licenses, and company-issued credentials like from Google and Meta and HubSpot and Microsoft are often embedded or incorporated into community college workforce offerings. So our brief provides examples of all of these. Um, and of course, community colleges offer many of a, a vocational or personal enrichment non-degree programs as well. Those were not the focus of this work. We focused on non-degree workforce programs that lead directly to work. And indeed, many workforce first colleges have actually sunset a vocational programs to double down on their missions as engines of economic mobility. So I wanted to just take a minute to really double down on one clarification. In our conversations, we saw non-degree and non-credit being used interchangeably. So just to be very um, precise here, we looked at all non-degree workforce programs, regardless if they came with college credit or not. We looked at programs above the high school diploma, but below the associate's degree. And indeed, in 25 states, community colleges also award bachelor's degrees. Uh, as we shared during another event we hosted here on Monday. Uh, so um, that's just another sort of clarification of the credential landscape that we find ourselves in. I also wanted to say that apprenticeship programs too can come with college credit and even degrees, and we studied one example in our briefs. So that is another interesting uh, uh, clarification um, as well. So. This is our quality framework for non-degree workforce programs. Over the course of three years, we have synthesized the field's best working understanding of high-quality programs. We studied the literature. We conducted hundreds of interviews with expert academics and analysts and journalists and funders and colleges and employers and unions and policymakers and workforce intermediaries. Uh, from, from all across the country and in fact the world to create a clear, comprehensive, and I think most importantly pressure-tested five-point criteria for building and identifying high-quality, um, equitable, non-degree programs. Uh, our brief go into great detail of how colleges can make this framework uh, embedded across their planning, delivery, and improvement processes for their programs. So. I'm um, really excited to, to hear what you all uh, think and, and how you might um, uh, adopt this framework in your own work. Central to the pressure testing, uh, Chauncey mentioned this, was our new models advisory committee, which I'd like to thank for their immense contributions. Their names are shown on screen and they're also in the reports. Massive thanks to this group of thinkers and doers. We really could not have done this without this group, so thank you. After building our five-point quality framework, we then selected a cohort of six community colleges with six varied high-quality non-degree workforce programs to reverse engineer them and figure out what makes them tick. The colleges and the programs are shown on screen. Then we realized that to understand how to get non-degree programs right, we really needed to complement our program level understanding with an understanding of what makes community colleges good at workforce education in the first place. So we launched a second cohort of six community colleges to study the college-wide institutional factors that allow community colleges to offer these non-degree programs um, in, a, in a quality fashion and at scale. So uh, this was a critical piece of the project to see both program level design and institutional level strategy and how those reinforce one another or not. And since you know storytelling was a key objective of this work, our project resulted in more than 100 
blogs and, and op-eds and comments and presentations and many of these stories are actually embedded in our briefs because that way we could have depth as well as breadth. So you'll find them scattered as links throughout our briefs, but you can also read them at newamerica.org slash new models. Um, many of the stories that we've produced as part of this project have spurred follow-on conversations and in fact even follow-on projects. So um, I wanted to, to take a moment to, to share those uh, uh, short form outputs as well. But of course, we are here to discuss the primary outputs uh, of this project, which our, are our briefs. So it's now my pleasure to unveil our new models for career preparation brief series. We produce three sequential briefs geared towards college presidents and vice presidents uh, that really focus on the three steps of offering high quality non-degree workforce programs, the planning step, the delivery step, and the continuous improvement iteration step. Um, the first two are available to you today, so please read them and let us know what you think. The final one will be released in Q1 of 2023. So you have something to look forward to when the holiday festivities are over and, and, and we have only winter. So, you know. Um, so now college leaders bring decades of expertise to their work. It would be presumptuous of us to think that our three 5,000 word-ish briefs could be an instruction manual for colleges. Rather, our briefs prioritize providing solutions to what we had heard were the field's biggest problems when creating these programs, their biggest pain points, and we address them with actionable solutions and concrete replicable examples that institutions and districts and states and systems could adopt in their own uh, um, uh, ecosystems. And many of the URLs to our own writing and the work of our peers are in the field are also incorporated in this work. So it's really, we wanted to build on the work, uh, field's work in this space. Um, so I'm gonna briefly go through uh, w a little bit of the content of these briefs. In our planning brief, we present replicable models to secure employer skin in the game and co-creation. How do you really promise that? Um, um, how do you have difficult conversations with employers, as Mary Alice mentioned, about job quality and pay for grads? How do you take advantage of this specific moment we're in with the tight labor market and with um, uh, employers really uh, sort of uh, vying for workers uh, to move the needle on pay and job quality attributes. We provide tips to finally make stackable credentials a reality and not just a promise. We provide tips to properly account for all of the expenses involved with offering a program, including hidden ones that get missed. This is a tactic called full cost budgeting, which we and our partners at the Nonprofit Finance Fund, uh, CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, uh, produce together. We have a technical assistance video and a dedicated report on making full cost a reality for colleges. Um, we provided tips on how to partner with new unexpected workforce allies. Mary Alice emphasizes in her comments, including unions and organizations that understand the innovation economy. This is a personal research interest of mine. One of my hats is to study community colleges in the future of work. And federally funded research and development centers, tech-based economic development entities, national labs, manufacturing USA institutes, there is a myriad of new allies that community colleges should work with to maximize the impact of these non-degree workforce programs. And you'll see examples of them in our briefs. So that is really the focus of our planning stage of the, the process that we focused on. A um, number of other topics addressed here as well, including student information systems and integrating interoperability for non-credit credit students, lots of technical aspects. In the delivery brief, the second brief, we provided colleges funding tactics, college level funding tactics, like asset monetization, 
priority-based budgeting, tax abatement utilization, really out-of-the-box thinking of how we can braid together funding to finance these programs, even if policymakers are taking their time with sustain, uh, systematic fixes. We provide tips for designing excellence, including by building staff capacity to deliver great workforce programmings, build concrete equity goals, and address occupational segregation, not leave it to chance, but really build it into the uh, objective of offering a program. How to build an effective marketing strategy so that people enroll and we stem the hemorrhaging enrollment declines at community colleges using these programs and many other topics. So our delivery brief really is the operational day-to-day -day administration of these programs. And Finally, in our forthcoming and final brief, we will provide colleges with tips to really collect and use program level outcomes data using models that exist. It is very difficult, but not impossible. Colleges, college systems, and states each have strategies that they could adopt to collect outcomes data for all of their various kinds of non-degree programs, how to revisit and leverage labor market information, both real-time data from private vendors, as well as utilizing publicly available labor market information and data that's, that's um, uh, freely available to institutions today. Um, and finally, how colleges can institutionalize feedback loops with employers and students and navigate uh, sort of uh, the continuous improvement feedback loop that would allow them to achieve the outcomes that their programs have set forth. So uh, there we have it, folks. Uh, uh, Iris and I hope our briefs are useful to you. Uh, I hope this presentation has enticed you to read the briefs. Um, tell us, email us, tell us what you love, tell us what needs additional clarity, um, get in touch with new story ideas or examples. Our work here is not done with these PDFs. We would love to work with you all to get uptake of these ideas and continue to do our part to maximize the impact of non-degree education at community colleges in this country. So thank you very much. So now the boring part is over. <laughs> off, off the stage I go, and I'm excited to invite our first expert panel to the stage, moderated by the one and only Paul Fain of the Job and Work Shift, as well as Miami Dades, Antonio Delgado, and Broward College Mildred Coyne, both exceptional leaders in the workforce education. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to Shaylin, uh, thanks to New America for hosting this hybrid event, and all of you for being here. Um, we're talking about non-degree, non-credit, micro-credential, short-term credential, whatever you, whichever your, your term of preference may be. I'm not going to do any introductions. We're just going to jump into this so I can leave a little time for questions. Um, the first is we're talking about quality. I think there's a reason these two folks are here. Uh, I think they know a little bit about quality in this space. So I wondered if. We'll start with Mildred. Uh, if you could describe a specific program that you've created in the last few years, a non-degree program, and you know how you created it, who it serves, the response from industry, sure. and how it fits with the broader strategy. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, Dr. Lennon, it was, it, your comments were perfect, because when, what we decided to do in 2018 was to take a deeper dive into our demographics and really take a good look at our communities. And despite all of the accolades of excellence that the Broward College was experiencing over the prior decade, we really took a look at who we, who we were serving, but more importantly, who we were missing. And when we disaggregated our local data of unemployment and education attainment data, we found and identified six zip codes in Broward, Broward County that had the highest unemployment, 9 to 15% unemployment, when we were experiencing a 2.8% unemployment in our community, and an education attainment of 27%. And that's, a, that's 25 to 64 year olds with an associate's degree or above. And when we, at the county level, we were at about 44% education attainment. So we knew that those six zip codes, as we took a deeper dive even into that population, we were only serving at a, uh, we have about 63,000 students at the time, 
And now we were only serving about 3,000 coming to us from those six zip codes that represent some of the largest cities in Broward County. And if you don't know Broward County, it is right above Miami-Dade. Everyone knows Miami. And um, Broward is Fort Lauderdale. And we're sandwiched between Miami-Dade and Palm Beach, and we're Fort Lauderdale, and we have, have a greater Fort Lauderdale area. We have 31 municipalities. But we recognized as the only higher education, public higher education institution in the community that we had to do better. And so we developed what we call Broward Up, and because we believe everyone can achieve unlimited potential, and we just have to make sure that we were de delivering on the promise that the community colleges are to be that beacon of higher education hope for our communities. And we pushed out into those six zip codes um, free workforce training. And we started with one location, partnering with the Urban League of Broward County, and offering training, free training in IT, supply chain, and manufacturing so that our community residents could come to a trusted partner, because that's very important for our community, to go to somewhere that they trust, but under a Broward College flag, begin to take college. And that was all done. We really feel like we bootstrapped this from the beginning in 2018 on a grant that we had from the governor's job growth grant at the time. And then we built out from there. And now we've, four years later, have developed um, an entire inventory of non-credit programs and have served over 3,300 individuals earning 2,100 work-ready credentials. We've increased continuing education enrollment by, by, to 13%. We've increased credit earned certificates from those communities by 7% in those four short years. So what we've done and looking at, we now offer healthcare and business programs, and we've seen that we're, we're tackling the challenge of providing adults with an on-ramp, a non-traditional on-ramp into college. Because one of the goals of Broward Up was very specifically to improve the education attainment levels. And we get there by starting people by, with continuing education, to helping them build confidence and competence, and giving them little wins so that they can come and, you know, it's like, it's like we lure them into the higher education arena by starting with continuing education. And now we've added in an entire employer component where we are um, also making sure that we're providing them the employment services to align those skills that they're learning, earning right into um, employment. Thanks for that. I think it's safe to say that Broward Up hits most of the bases, uh, if not all of them, uh, for what I've seen in the country. Um, Antonio, I know Miami-Dade's been active in the space too. Can you give us a sense of a program that for you really speaks to the question here? Yes, Paul, thank you. And uh, Antonio Delgado, Miami-Dade College. And we do have many programs that are relevant to our local community that leads to employment, of course. But I'm going to talk about one particular program that is not only relevant for the Miami-Dade community, it's actually relevant for the nation, and it's in um, electric vehicles. We have seen, especially with Tesla, we did a partnership with Tesla, their main manufacturer of electric vehicles, and they have a shortage of electric vehicle technicians. Of course, they're selling more than ever, more manufacturers are coming, but there are not enough workforce that know how to operate and fix and really put in pieces and put it back together an electric vehicle. So this is part of, of the reality that you know, companies face nowadays. It's like, when I have a shortage, do I create the program and teach people to get into my skills? And the, the reality is like, yes, that might happen, but their expertise is not in education. So in this case, we partner with Tesla because we are the experts on education, and community colleges are well positioned to really help on that non-degree pathway to give you short-term program heavy on skills, heavy on get, getting you ready, and then in, in this partnership, it's called the Tesla Start. We get students through a full, heavy Tesla experience with the Tesla vehicles, Tesla equipment, computers, everything, curriculum developed actually by Tesla, but delivered at Miami-Dade College, and then we get the students, every single graduate from the program has a pathway to a job at Tesla. So it's, it's that natural transition that can be replicated anywhere in the nation. And actually, the graduates decide where to go, depending on where the opening is at Tesla. They can go anywhere in the nation to really serve the needs of a new workforce industry that is only going to grow. So we see as the just a pilot that is just showing the, the future being electric vehicles, how can we prepare the students short term? And by the way, being paid with a stipend while they're in the program, because we don't want them to think about getting a, a job after coming to the class, it's just focus on getting the skills, focus on getting ready, and then you get a job. And the age of those students, any age. Coming out of a 
uh, high school all the way to 50 and 60 years old that we have had in the program already. And again, every single graduate after two years implementing this program on periods of 16 weeks, every single graduate has got a job at Tesla, which again, when you talk about this well-known company, anyone in the community is, how can I get a job at Tesla? So that's exactly the pathway that we built at Miami Dade College. And uh, thank you to Charlene and the New America team to really highlight this program nationally through this program and now through this panel. Thanks for that. And I know you both have multiple programs that fit the bill. Um, I want to return to the on-ramp concept. We all love Chauncey's beehive uh, analogy. It's great. And I think, you know, I've been surprised by some of the, the polling of younger adults, 20, 30-somethings, the folks who are sitting out of the community college pipeline right now really high interest in pursuing education and training, doubts about the payoff reasonably, I think, and of course barriers like time and money. How can you ensure, first of all, why, and let's start with you, Mildred, why is the short-term program, in your opinion, potentially more appealing to that population? But more importantly, how can you ensure that it is that kind of first step, mm -hmm. not just the final step? Sure. Well, for us, the continuing education piece takes, uh, by helping people start or get their first step in their journey or recover their previous experience that they had that might not have resulted in a degree through continuing education or the non-credit side, we eliminate a lot of the obstacles that higher education typically puts in the path. And the, a lot of the challenges that the community has said, I don't want to deal with any of that. I don't need, you know, I want to get a job. I want to go have something better for my family. And, my, and, um, and have a better quality of life and grow my, have my economic mobility increase. And the on-ramp for continuing education is much less. In, you know, we don't have to do a lot of the paperwork uh, for residency, for all sorts of other things that require so much um, documentation and swirl for a person that's really, their, their resources and time are very maxed out. Um, we also see that they're, you know, people are looking for work. They really want to make a connection to the marketplace. You know, the dignity of work is a real thing. Someone's connection to the marketplace and giving them a sense of purpose and value is a game changer. And it makes people feel connected and valuable and important and it changes their relationships at home, it changes their neighborhood, it changes their community. And so what we're able to do with this on-ramp for continuing education is give people quick wins, as I mentioned before, but connect them to the marketplace and give them an, a, a path back into higher education where we're working with employers to pay that next level of education attainment for the person that's, that's working with them so they're learning and earning and continuing. It's not 100% an apprenticeship model, although we love the apprenticeship model and are growing that at the college level as well. But this is a real partnership that we're having with employers that are then investing in the, in the employee having them come back, and we're working with employers to actually build career ladders within their pipe, their, their paths within their organization. So one example is Broward Health. We, they have an entire um, inventory of employees that they are, are gap that they're missing in their revenue cycle side, the operations of the hospital, non-clinical side. And we're working with them to build that on-ramp into those entry-level positions, but it's not enough for us to say, okay, we're, we'll help you be your talent supply for your entry-level positions, only if there's a career pathway within your organization for people to grow, because we need people to continue to grow within their career trajectory, earn additional credentials, and the, and the employer has built those career ladders. They literally have, here's your first job, here's what you add in next in your education, here's your next job, here's your education piece, and we're helping them build that. And we're having those courageous conversations with the employer, and that's what's helping them build a talent supply from our marginalized communities. These are not community members that, that were typically getting hired. So we're, because we're able to take their early training curriculum, offer it to the residents in our communities, and give those residents access to those jobs, and then the employer has built the on-ramp and is then supporting them through that traditional, through the next levels of their education. We've really seen a great synergy there and um, an engagement with community members that hadn't been um, engaged in the marketplace, and we're seeing a real great way for them to get on board. And then the last thing I said, I'll say, and I'll, I will answer your question, I promise, is that we also um, 
built articulation. So as someone earns those credentials, they can either be bundled or they can get a one-for-one -one if the course is built in conjunction with our college faculty, that we can articulate them into and accelerate them into that degree program. And so that's what else we think is really attractive because we do believe that education attainment is the pathway to a resilient wage because one credential and a short-term credential does not a resilient wage make. We know it's stacked and laddered into those degree programs. Which I, I do think your institutions are probably ahead of the curve in, in the ability to do that. It's still pretty rare, I think. But Antonio, can you add anything what your institution does to ensure that that first step isn't the only step? So basically, I'm going to focus my answer on technology. So we focus on not what the college thinks should be done, it's actually what industry tell us what they're looking for. And technology is one of those areas where on one side there is a lot of industry certifications, so technology companies developing their own certifications and that becomes a credential of value where the degree that we offer is relevant, but the company is not looking necessarily just for a degree, they're looking for a credential of value or in other cases in technology for skills like software development. What matters is that you know how to develop software, not necessarily that you have a degree. So in this area of technology, which I work heavily in Miami Dade College, we try to bring that experience through the non-credit programs or boot camps where we offer the training or, or the, the opportunity for students to learn. Doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the background, is come and get a certification. Come and get a skill that can actually bring value to get that first job. And in doing that, we have seen a huge increase, of course, on students getting that credential, the industry certification, but also actually looking for more education because there is a reality. That credential or the industry certification or the software development skills can help you get your first job. But yes, it's great, it's great for the first step that you were asking. It's more about how do you continue developing? How do you continue to the next level? And that's when the students realize they, they come for a first course first group of courses that are focused on certifications and they realize, okay, I can expand. And actually that's the purpose of education. Understanding what are the industry needs, mapping those needs, delivering that education, but then creating a pathway for the students to see that's not gonna be enough in the long term. That's just for your first step. And then many students realize later on, we try to put it in advance before you get to that roadblock, like, oh, by the way, you never completed a degree. So that's why we do it in a way to, to answer your question in stackable credentials. So as Mildred said, we provide credits even when you went through a non-degree program, if you completed a certification, we give you the credits for that certification so you can easily translate that experience and that credential to a credit that later on counts into an associate degree, but also is a stack into a bachelor degree. So we make it easier for those that are looking for a job in the short term don't think about an education of four years to get into that job. Think about getting credentials, you get a job now, and then you continue coming to school. What we do to facilitate that, we offer the classes, technology classes in the evenings. So you continue coming, to, you work during the day, you come to school at night, and you complete an associate degree in the stackable credential model, and then you continue, you get a promotion, you get to a bachelor degree. So it's really the natural transition that we have implemented to make sure that we deliver on both ways, serving industry needs, getting our local community with skills to get the first job, but getting, giving them a long-term plan to actually get to higher paying jobs. I don't need to tell you <clears throat> that in higher education, the non-credit to credit uh, transition is not always seamless. Uh, students lose a lot of credits, it often doesn't count towards whatever they end up majoring in. Can you give us a sense, and I'll start with you, Antonio, here, of, of what Miami does to make that possible? I mean, you made it sound pretty seamless, and I believe that that is the case, but how hard was that to accomplish? So to make it seamless, the easier way is industry certifications, mm -hmm. because if you pass, a, 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 and if you get that credential, it's because you pass an exam, it's because you demonstrated your skills, so that is a credential that you have already, and then we create a seamless pathway. You have a credential, don't worry about taking that class, you can prove that you have the knowledge. What is harder to make it is when there is no certification, no, no credential that can testify that you actually completed, completed a training. And I will use the analogy of software development. Like you know how to develop software, but there is no credential that tells like, yes, you, you have that skill. So it depends more then on the 
support on the mechanisms that we create in the college between the School of Continuing Education and the schools that deliver the degrees on the translation from non-credit to credit. It's creating those pathways and, and connections to understand what the non-credit programs are offering, not just from Miami Dade College, but talking about companies like Google with the Google certificates where we recognize there is no final exam on the Google certificate, but we recognize the skills that the students are learning lear through Google on Coursera. Separate third party, but we recognize the skills and then we said, okay, you, you, you learn really good skills that are actually transferable to our data analytics bachelor degree. So we recognize those skills and we hope the students get a number of credits and then makes an easier pathway to say, great, with a certificate from Google, you might possibly get a first job, but not really. At some point, you're going to be required a bachelor degree. You have a natural pathway. It doesn't matter where you are in the nation. You did it on Coursera, and then there is a pathway to complete a bachelor degree online at Miami Dade College that gives you an option to have an official degree that complements that certificate. So we do a lot of mapping of those skills that happen even when there is no certification, and that's actually what we did with Tesla. They complete the, the, the program. It's like 800 hours of you know, heavy training for four months, and then we translate that into a, a pathway for a common associate in science in electric, uh, electric vehicles technician. So it's really finding a way that what you learn counts towards the credit side, but it's the willingness to work between both sides, non-credit and credit. Well, what I'll also add is the state of Florida, what, what Antonio is talking about too for industry certifications, nationally recognized third-party industry credentials, is the state of Florida has then a standard, a gold standard articulation agreement. So every, every one of the Florida 28 community colleges, if you earn that um, industry certification, it, is there's a state articulation agreement so that an individual can come to what any, any one of the 28 community colleges and earn a certain level of credits at that institution. But we can all individually, locally, go beyond that. And that's, uh, so it, but it gives us a really strong articulation framework to build on. And so one of the other ways that we're doing it at Broward, in addition to that standard that the state has through our industry certain, he is right, Antonio is right, it is the cleanest because they're demonstrating mastery by passing that exam. We're also now working with our faculty to identify where we already have institutional challenge exams that our faculty have developed and have in our, tank, uh, our test bank, in our testing centers, that an, a person can come in and challenge their competence and get, then get credit. Mm -hmm. And now we want to further look at our continuing education courses as being that skill builder for that, for that individual to challenge that exam and get credit. So that's another way, because it, it is, um, it, that b being able to demonstrate mastery does make the articulation simpler. We're also working with our faculty to help develop companion continuing education courses for our credit college credit certificates, for our credit courses that are in our short-term certificates that are laddered as a part of the degree. And that also has been really successful. We right now have 16 courses that our faculty have developed that we can offer on the continuing education side that we're defining the policy so that anyone who takes those 16 courses can articulate then and springboard into their degree. Because that is ultimately the goal still, right, is to get to that individual to have that degree because that's where the resilient wage li lies. But that also still gives them the skill sets to be able to find employment and work with our um, employment specialists to get jobs. Absolutely. Let's talk about tech certifications or micro credentials for a second. And Tony, you mentioned it. I mean, I read a lot about uh, the professional certificates available through Coursera from big tech companies. Each one is different in a lot of ways. Um, but I wonder how you determine which ones are most valuable to students and to employers. And I'm thinking about this in part, like how to design your own micro-credential versus using one from industry. You know, uh, Goldie Blumenstick, who's here uh, from the Chronicle of Higher Education, wrote about a local project to embed micro-credentials in four-year degree programs that had very little pickup by students, and I believe industry, I think in part potentially because the colleges themselves, universities, were designing those credentials themselves. They didn't use, uh, you know, Salesforce or Meta. How do you make that decision, Antonio? Which ones seem to have the most value? So that's a really good topic that micro-credentials have been exploding on the last few years and badges and digital badges becoming a, a theme. And really, 
it could be dangerous, as you mentioned, when everyone is developing, but then there is no value on them. Mm -hmm. Because really, what matters is not the development of it, it's who values. Like, who values these credentials? Industry. Mm -hmm. When they are offering jobs for, for people, or, or jobs or, or promotions, for people that already have a credential, say, like, okay, you can demonstrate this skill, let's move it up. So for, for us, what Miami Dade College, we really consider is the partnership with industry. We are not telling students what's best for them. We partner with industry to understand what is better for industry when they're looking for talent because we need to make sure that our education maps the opportunities for employment. So learning from industry, if the most uh, looked after certifications in cloud computing are from AWS, Microsoft, and Google, that's for us to understand, yeah, we can create our own batch in, in cloud computing, but that's going to be valuable for industry? Probably not. What they're looking is, show me that the students have one of these credentials, and that's what we did when we developed the cloud computing program. So looking into data that prove what is necessary, especially in Miami, but now really in a remote work anywhere in the, in the country, and then validating that information with our local employers, with our advisory committees. Like, it, is this a type of talent? Is this a type of credential that you need when you're hiring? So when we do the matching, that really empowers us to say, great, we're partnering with Amazon Web Services to send our faculty for training to get them certified, and now our faculty can actually start teaching and certify our students to a point that we have over 300 students certified without any experience in cloud computing yet through their academic program. And really, the AWS Solutions Architect is a certification that is valued at a six-figure salaries. Our students are getting that certification without any experience yet, just in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that's the point of mapping the right certification in the courses that today could be AWS, tomorrow could be another provider. It's not just marrying to one. It's just having the flexibility and the freedom to, to move around, but making sure that we stay relevant into what industry is looking for. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, although this is not an easy question, you know, I think stackability and portability, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that let's use AWS. I mean, I've read data that shows something like 90% of people in cloud have one of the AWS certifications. So obviously deep market penetration, but what do you say to somebody who's worried if I change jobs and they use, you know, Microsoft or Google Cloud, mm -hmm. will those skills port over? Great question because of course, and, and the way that we develop the programs is actually cloud computing. We don't say cloud computing right. with one provider. We give the students the skills to be really able to transfer those agnostic. skills. doesn't matter to exactly agnostic to any provider that they can apply those skills. And then we match to a certification because we want the students to have that in their resume to get the first job. Mm -hmm. But at the end, to your point, it's just transferable. It's just like one company calls one thing in one way and the other one uses the same product on a different name. The students are really able to transfer those skills from one company to the other one. And that, only, that doesn't only apply to cloud computing. It really applies to cybersecurity yeah. or data analysis or even software development with different programming languages. Mm -hmm. What matters is the core skills that they learn and then helping them get a credential to help them on the resume to get that first job. Would you like to add? Well, I don't want to take us in too far of a different yep, yep. angle, but one of the other ways that we're using micro-credentials, and we were a recipient of a Strengthening Community Colleges grant through the Department of Labor um, to build out micro-credentials at the college. And we've also, like Antonio, and looking at skills that ladder and stack into the credential, making sure that they're value added to the employer, but we also have built it for soft skills, you know, our workplace essential skills. That has, because I think that's also a challenge with non-credit or short-term credentials is they often get, well, you're not gonna get the full well-rounded individual that just has the skill competency. So we really have taken the approach with our micro-credentials to also build out those core competencies that we all need to have no matter what your technical competence is. And so we have um, micro-credentials that are also working with our students and giving them value-added cr credentials in, um, in problem solving and critical thinking and communication and professionalism and those types of skills that every employer needs and, and have been validated and documented across the, you know, for a decade really on the gaps that the employers are experiencing there. And again, though, 
it's really the, the proof is going to be in whether that student is actually demonstrating professionalism that will add the value to what that credential is. So the employer hiring that student better see professionalism if they're going to have a Broward College professionalism badge. So it's holding everybody accountable to make sure, or otherwise the credential doesn't have value. So to Antonio's point, that the employer is the one who really has to, to see value in the credential. So I want to open it up to questions in a minute here, but first, kind of a big ticket question. This isn't a policy panel, but it is a quality panel. Um, can you give your thoughts to folks who are nervous about opening up Pell to a shorter term program? Mildred, you and I were talking about <laughs> a, a four-week program. You know, it, just, just big ticket here. What would you tell someone who's worried about whether or not public funds should go to these shorter term credentials? Well, I would say our, our continuing education, our non-credit programs are an on-ramp for people that traditionally would not be coming to us. The widening gap of people earning a bachelor's degree or, versus those that are not in our, in our society is, is, is evident of that. We still are not penetrating, after generations and generations of study on this, we are not penetrating the people that still need access to higher education. I explained it in my opening data of those communities that are still not gaining access. And so being proximate to people and making sure that it's relevant to the training that they need. So I will give you an example. We are now the lead for a consortium of schools in Florida that are launching a commercial truck driving program, the CDL program, right? Commercial truck drivers, four weeks of training. It is pretty pricey. It can be anywhere from three to five thousand or seven thousand dollars or more, you know, depending on where you go to get that truck driving license. Four weeks of training and you can make seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year as a starting career. Uh, for you. Um, we're also bundling that with some other certifications, but if we don't have access to those life-changing wages for people, we're going to continue the cycle of the, those that have access to time and treasure to be able to get to longer credentials are going to continue to have access to higher education with it still leaving people in the margins. And that would be... And it, forgive me if I'm example. wrong here, but in that example, there are, there are subsidies that are going to make that more affordable. They're not, they're not usually going to be eating that 5000 No, so in the example that we're doing for the consortium, we have a, a, the governor, again, has invested in his, his job growth fund into this consortium so that we can bring to life. For Broward College alone, we're one of four schools in the consortium. We're, we're training 250 um, res community members for commercial truck driver's license a year. So we have a 10-year lo launch, so we're looking at some 1,800 people that we're looking to put into truck driving because we know that there's a shortage there and it gives people an on-ramp into a great career. We also are building an articulation model for that so that people can continue to grow and have a career path that's not only truck driving, but it's also bundling other non-credit certifications in supply chain or um, a OSHA certification or a forklift so that they have a career trajectory and then roll that into associate degree um, credentials. But it is subsidized right now through a governor's grant. And that will, but that'll continue to need, for sustainability, we're going to need to have some policy change around that for short-term pal. Antonio? No, definitely. Well, we have explained today's an example of, you know, like things are changing and, and we, we have to serve the people from our community. And not everyone follows the same pathway of the traditional high school to college, four-year degree full-time, and then I graduate, I get my first job. Great, that pathway exists, but now there are all these alternative pathways for non-traditional students. And to be able to help those students is great. It's like funding and, and Pell really helps make that happen. So definitely support for these programs outside of the traditional, you need to have minimum 16 weeks to get some type of financial aid. Like no, there are programs that can actually help you get faster and they're not even 15 or 16 weeks. And obviously, as Mariella said, there's uh, $4 trillion of uh, job mm -hmm. potential support, uh, infrastructure support that, that may be outside of Pell for, for a lot of these programs. Well, I want to stop asking my questions. I have plenty more. I hope you and the, the folks online will ask some questions. Shailen, how do, we, how do we turn to them? So I have our first online question to get us started. This question comes from Holly Zanville at George Washington University. Um, uh, what have you found at Broward and Miami-Dade to be most effective in getting students to know about the non-degree programs and help them with even choice making, deciding which program is the best option for them? Uh, would love your thoughts. Great question. 
So on, on, on our side, I will say that the first thing that we don't do, we don't call it non-degree programs because no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do a non-degree program. So <laughs> what, what we do to really is to focus on the employment component. Mm -hmm. So for example, when you partner with a company like Tesla and you put a job waiting at the end, we got thousands without marketing just by making an announcement. We didn't pay for marketing to, for, for this new program. And of course, this is an exception because it's Tesla. But overall, what we put in front of our community is the pathway to a job. Mm -hmm. We don't even sell the pathway to a degree because that will come after. That's, that will come when they are in the program, that they see the long term. But our focus is there is a job. Mm -hmm. Short term program, get the skills, get a credential, get a job. And then what we've also done is we truly believe in the being proximate model. So we are delivering the non-credit training, and I agree very much with what Antonio is saying, is it's about the employment capability or possibilities at the end. Um, but we um, have put those classes proximate to our community members. We are in people's neighborhoods. In those six zip codes, we are partnering with trusted agencies, Boys and Girls Club, Jack and Jill Children's Center, Urban League of uh, Broward County, uh, the YMCA, and we're actually delivering those services in partnership with those agencies. So um, people are going to their trusted partners for services, and then they're working. With, then they're getting a brow, access to a Broward College Career Pathway Navigator that's helping them make those choices, helping helping them do needs assessment, career planning, and education planning, all those things that we've had all externally funded by philanthropy, corporate donations, and it's been a phenomenal model that has really helped us get proximate to our community. And not only the community agencies, but also the municipalities that are in those zip, six zip codes. So we're leveraging those relationships. And those trusted partners then are pushing out all the information about the inventory of programming that we're offering for free. All of our classes are free to the community residents in those six zip codes. And we've now expanded to 11 zip codes. Quick piggyback on that. I hear this a lot. When, when That's a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get skepticism from prospective students about it being real? No, because it's because trusted they're, partners. Well, yes, because they're working with the trusted agencies that 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 they already have a long-standing relationship with, and it's word of mouth, and then it's a referral, and 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 we have family stories mm -hmm. of where the daughter took a class, and now she brought her mother in, and then her her friend, and and the and it just is spreading throughout the communities. And that's been an incredible referrals pipeline for us. And we have you know, the numbers to prove to show that it's working. And on my side, I can tell you, yes. Like when we have this partnership with Generation IT, a nonprofit or a generation, helping this non-degree pathway to get certifications and then get a job, and it was free. Like it was a great partnership that is 100% free that when you promise, free education with a credentials cover and a job at the end, mm -hmm. people think that you're, you're lying. <laughs> like, yes, there is skepticism to say, oh, that's a scam for yeah. sure. Yeah. Like how they got Miami Dade College name to be on that scam. No, it's not a scam. So sometimes it's actually, <laughs> it takes time to really prove that it's true to create the, the stories of the students that are doing it and to the word of mouth. Like, yes, I went through the program and it's incredible. Like we have done it in IT, cloud computing, like all these areas where they get the credential, they get a job, is happening. But when you make it 100% free, like people say, oh no, that, that, that cannot be possible. And yes, it's, it happens. Well, it definitely helps to be a trusted community partner. Community of college. course. Uh, other questions online in the room? Don't be shy. Got a few more minutes. Uh, you, you went first, I think. Please. If you have a question, can you actually come back oh, yeah. to the microphone? Sorry about that. Thank you. And try to keep them brief. We only have about eight minutes here, I think. Hi, thanks. Um, do you have access to data to demonstrate that your students are stacking credentials or to just demonstrate what their labor market outcomes are? And if you do, how did you get them? That seems to be a challenge for many colleges. I'm happy to if you want. Yeah. So yes, we absolutely do have uh, data to demonstrate the number of credentials that a student's, student's taking and their journey into the degree. So we have uh, um, my latest, I don't know why I have all these facts in my head, but the, the, the one that I shared with our faculty this welcome back in August was that we have 206, in 2021, we have 260 students that are sitting in our college credit classes taking 5,000 
32 credit hours that have started with continuing education. So it is truly an on-ramp into the credit degree programs. And it's a non-traditional path. So I was imploring our faculty to consider who they have in their seats. They've started their journey in a different way, but they, they demonstrated grit and they've earned their confidence and confidence through continuing education and need to continue to have that wraparound support that we've provided them in the community and now they're in their, in their classrooms. The labor market data is a bit harder to tackle. I would love to have policy discussion around that. We all need it and the entire country needs better access right. to real-time data. Um, we do have a, a shared uh, rela a, a relationship and a project that's underway with um, Opportunity Insights out of Harvard University, Ro Dr. Raj Chetty, and working with them on helping us um, demonstrate that economic mobility of our, of our participants and our students. We also have our institutional research team is developing an economic mobility model for our community college students. We've seen one from the, for, a state univer for universities that isn't exactly correct for, for community colleges. So now? we have developed one internally that's look, and, and it's getting validated through the same entities that are working on that um, higher, uh, the university one. And we really are hopeful because it doesn't exist for community colleges, so we're building one. We just believe that there has to be, ultimately we believe that that's the measure of our effectiveness is people's ability to change their economic fortune, right? So moving up the income, our goal for Broward Up is increase economic mobility by two income quintiles or more. It's because just one isn't enough. It's not enough to build a resilient wage. So um, we're, we're in, in partnership with Opportunity Insights or in building our own. But access to real-time labor market data is a challenge for all of us. I, I see a lot of heads nodding. And we're working with the state. We need a better system. Antonio, I, think no, I, I will definitely echo. Uh, we, we are recipient of a good job challenge grant from the Department of Commerce, the, um, EDA, and it's all about good job challenge. It's like you get people with jobs, especially in the tech sector uh, that I've been discussing today. So we do follow every data from the student from when they get in, credentials, wraparound services, are they retention, graduation, all the data that is in our hands. But I echo Nodred that what happens when they get a job? Mm -hmm. Like, if we have a, the, depending on the relationship with the companies, either we find out because the student wanted to tell us or the companies told us, but many times even the privacy policy from the company is like, hey, I got a lot of your students, but I cannot tell you who they are. <laughs> Great. Happy for the students, but it's a challenge when we get the data, you know, a year and a half, two years later, awesome. that's not relevant anymore for when the student got the job. And that's something that definitely we're looking for solutions and, and mm -hmm. trying to find solutions nationwide. Right. I think we have time for one more quick one. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Uh, hi. Um, in the conversation around di diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think conversation around disabled students is really relevant. Um, in the, there's been a lot of conversation about with the, there's not a low number of workers, it's just we're not really finding them. So I'm curious how your institutions are supporting those who are maybe neurodivergent or have maybe aren't normal, quote unquote, and how you're working with that um, group because they can fill certain jobs that other people may not want to have. So I'm curious if your institutions are working in that kind of space. We actually have a, um, a program, we, uh, if it has an acronym, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to tell you what the name is, but um, where we're actually working with individuals with intellectual disabilities and being able to bring them in and give them college experience as well as workplace experience in a very um, collaborative environment with other departments on a campus. That's actually on a campus and, it, and it's within our, um, it's from a grant from UCF actually, University of Central Florida. So it's been a, a really great, model for us to work with our many students that come to us and have the desire and, and interest and capabilities of, of having college experience and it's really giving them that next step forward. But it's also partnering with some of our employers to uh, Publix is a good example of an employer that is really fantastic at working with uh, people with special needs. And so we're, we're build, we've built a, a training model that then the students can go right into that employment. 
so it's the same. Exactly the same model. Our program is called Access, and we have eight campuses, so we have an access department on each of these campuses to make sure that we facilitate and provide services. And, and we call them students with special abilities. So there is a very specific approach to make sure that we provide the opportunities and uh, for those jobs that they could be better than anyone else on doing mm -hmm. those jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's already implemented and it, you know, from a faculty perspective with disabilities also been demonstrating that yes, even a faculty can, or, or someone with disabilities can be a faculty at Miami Dade College or get a job at Miami Dade College. So it's very active, uh, the support. Well, we're at time. That went fast. I want to, I want to thank uh, New American Lumina for hosting this, but mostly Mildred and Antonio for thank sharing you. your expertise. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Super. Well. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm Iris Palmer, Deputy Director for Community Colleges here at New America. Um, and I hope you all are as inspired by that discussion and the conversation that we've had um, today as I am. Um, so Shailen did a really nice job going over our implementation brief series, um, but what he didn't talk about is that we have a whole suite of policy recommendations, both federal and state policy recommendations that can help facilitate scaling and creating these high quality programs in a more systemic way than maybe they are right now. Um, so throughout the three years of the project, we heard again and again about how policy could be used to support creating the operation and scale um, of these high quality pro degree programs. And since making policy recommendations is like our bread and butter and what we do, um, we decided to pull these observations together in uh, one brief, a set of recommendations that really could be given to state and federal policymakers to consider if they want to strengthen and support these programs, which we would think is a great idea. Um, I will warn you, this is policy. It's wonky. This might sound like a very long laundry list, and it is. It's a very long laundry list because, frankly, our policy environment right now doesn't do a great job of supporting community colleges and supporting these programs, startup, operation, and scale. Um, so we, I, we broke these recommendations into three categories. Um, financing, really we know where government puts its money and how government spends its money is one of its greatest powers. Um, data, which we heard Mildred already talk about today, and then facilitating collaboration between um, institutions and also co facilitating collaborations between institutions and employers. So first, financing. This is obviously the big one. We broke this into federal and state financing policy. Um, and our first recommendation around federal financing is really to reform some of those legacy programs. Um, the big federal workforce investment, the CTE federal workforce investment, so the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and Perkins. Um, so WIOA is, and I'm just going to use the acronyms from here on out, sorry about that. That's, that's part of policy. Um, WIOA is the largest federal workforce investment, and it is a really complicated law. Um, but we recommend actually doubling funding for the services provided through Title I of WIOA, and that's things like the American Job Centers and individual training accounts. And the rationale for this is that that piece of our workforce system has been really horribly underfunded over time. Um, and we think that actually doubling funding for that would go a long way to solving a lot of these problems, but we shouldn't just do that. We would also create a dedicated funding stream um, for training. Um, and that would support uh, what we know works with federal training money, and that's really sectoral partnerships. We have randomized control trial evidence that this is an effective training strategy. Um, and this funding would would flow through contracts, um, so a certain number of students would receive training that was directly related to a particular sector. We think this would be easier for the colleges to administer, it would be easier for connecting to local um, workforce investment agencies, and it would be better for connecting with employers. So, oh, whoops, I'm advancing too fast. 
my list is too, going too fast. Anyway, um, Perkins is the largest investment in career and technical education. Um, and right now, the money is split between K-12 and post-secondary education. Here, once again, we would increase funding because, frankly, it's a tiny program. It needs to be bigger. Um, we'd build a stronger requirement for collaboration between K-12 and higher education. We'd update the performance metrics so we know what um, occupation completers actually get jobs in. And then we'd create a dedicated funding stream for the innovation and modernization grants that hopefully would help some of the innovative work that you heard about earlier um, really be strengthened and scaled. All right, now to the next one. So we would also fund a host of competitive grant programs that would do different things. Um, the first one would really um, increase the capacity of community colleges to offer these programs. I think Mary Alice mentioned this morning, the capacity at community colleges to do this well is um, spotty, and frankly, a lot of staff are asked to do five, six, seven jobs. Um, and so either increasing um, funding for the Strengthening Community College Training Grant or funding TACT, again, that was also mentioned earlier, the Obama-era investment in these programs we think would be a really, really good investment. Um, we also would have a program that would support students' basic needs or, and or provide emergency grant aid. Frankly, we did this at a huge scale during the pandemic. It had incredible outcomes, I think, for students, and we would institutionalize that and continue it. And we would also support apprenticeships and continue to increase, um, increase that support. It's already have, we already have many grant programs for this, but we really think that supporting the infrastructure and tuition costs for those programs is particularly important. Um, and then Mary Alice, and actually we've heard this from Paul too, um, there are many, 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 many investments across the federal government that support training. Um, it's a very fractured, I wouldn't even call it a system, it's a fractured funding environment. And one thing we heard again and again in this work is that it's hard for community colleges to focus on equity in these programs, and it's really hard for community colleges to focus on job quality in these programs. And so we would actually embed priorities around developing systems to support equity and connect to job quality across some of these really myriad investments that the federal government already has. So for states, um, states can be more systemic in how they fund their community colleges because they're really funding them more directly. Less, it's less um, uh, vouchers and, grant and competitive grant programs and much more direct um, investment in their colleges. So uh, for states that are interested in creating more high quality workforce programs, um, we would actually recommend creating a systemic and sustainable funding programs for startup. Um, we heard this is a huge problem for many programs. Um, and there's a couple ways that states might be able to do that. Um, they could uh, create a interest-free loan program. We've seen this model in uh, states like Kentucky, where institutions could get a startup grant and then pay it back over time. Um, and it would be even better if they required that institutions use data to demonstrate that these programs um, are needed and could be effective. Uh, we'll talk more about data later, but we think that there are some interesting models around that. Um, next, we would recommend creating a dedicated funding stream that would complement a new federal program to support navigation and basic needs. We've already seen programs like this in California, Oregon, and Iowa, and frankly, we heard from some of our um, cohort colleges that these were incredibly important programs to help them support students through these programs and navigating the post-secondary environment. And then we would definitely support continued operations. Um, there's, a couple, there's some ways to do this as well. Um, Employer-funded skills uh, funds are one really important way to really connect these strongly to employers. So the employer pays into the fund. It's use or lose. They can use it to support training of their incumbent or new workers by working with their community college system. Um, and many states have these funds, but really making them um, a heart of these continued programs could be a really strong strategy. Um, funding credit and training through, uh, or non-credit through contact hours. So um, states have a crazy amount of different systems for doing this or not doing it. Many states don't do it at all. Most of them fund it at less, um, at, a, at a lower level. Um, and we've seen in states that have really robust funding for their non-credit systems that those no, that, that non-credit um, education can be more easily um, connected to, I think, the um, for-credit education and their, their innovation that goes on there can connect 
better. Um, and then changing the way state appropriations flow to create incentives for the types of programs and graduates that the states want. I'll remain agnostic about how exactly that's created, but we think that that's another really powerful um, strategy in this. And last, I'm just going to say community colleges can't create good jobs all on their own, and there are powerful state strategies that can support that. Um, one is high road training partnerships that have been going on in California, so really supporting employers improving their job quality. And the other is, um, and I'm just going to call out uh, allied health here, <laughs> but um, Medicaid pass-through programs that increase wages for frontline healthcare workers. And now we get to data. Um, so we have recommendations to both provide data to the community college and the people who are creating programs, and then also for policymakers and the public. Um, so our first recommendation is to provide program level wage and placement data to colleges and the people creating these programs. So this is really looking at outcomes, recommend, uh, the, the outcomes of their student graduates and the people that they served. We talked earlier about how this is really hard. It is really hard. Um, and so really states should connect their unemployment insurance data on credit and non-credit programs <laughs> with graduates and provide those to college at a program level. So it's actually something they can use. Um, and frankly, the federal government should create a student-level data network that can help augment some of the state and, and, and fill in some of the um, blanks in the state UI records or unemployment records, like looking across state lines for employment outcomes. Um, states should also fund and support the use of labor market information. So we think of this as like looking at those online job postings, looking at projections for where openings are going to be in work. Um, and so colleges can use those and programs can use those to plan effectively for new programs or updating current programs. Um, and then for prospective students and policymakers, there should really be clear access to outcomes data. And we hear this a lot when we talk to adult students. They want to know how much money they're going to make and what program they should go to. And even if that doesn't necessarily always change the choice of program, it's important to be transparent about it. So states should create dashboards and employment outcomes for programs and graduates. California has done an amazing job of this. I would want to see it more um, across the country. And the federal government should strengthen in the college, the college scorecard and add non-credit data to iPads, which unfortunately did not work this last summer, but we would hope that would be revisited. Um, and then last but not least, states should support collaboration, and frankly, the federal government should kick some money into this as well, but really, this is about um, capacity on the ground. So states should really support um, their community colleges implementing practices that support high-quality non-degree programs. And this is true um, for supporting sector strategies, but also supporting the implementation of these programs, both um, for good jobs, but also for planning around equity. Those two sort of um, places that we saw needed the most improvement over the course of this work. So please keep in touch with us. I ran through that really fast. It's all written down in a really long policy brief if anybody's looking for more details. Um, and also, obviously, I'm happy to answer any questions. So as Shailen, our team is here to talk more about these. We really hope that states and the federal government seize this opportunity to strengthen the um, support for these programs. Um, and with that, um, I want to go ahead and introduce our next panel, which I will be a part of. So that's going to be fun. Um, Goldie Blumenstick will be our, um, our facilitator. She's a senior writer at The Chronicle. Amanda Winters, who's program director at the National Governors Association, and Ji Hangley, who's president and CEO of the uh, Association of Community College Trustees. Um, Alex Cardell, unfortunately, um, cannot join us. He had an emergency come up and will not be part of the panel, which we will very much miss him, but I think Goldie reached out for some of his thoughts on our policy recommendations. Um, so with that, if you can help me, welcome our panel. Like You're supposed to go to the far end. Do you need to turn on my microphone? It's on. I did this wrong. I'm going to come around. Thanks. Okay. Hi. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Goldie Blumenstick. I'm a senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education, and I write The Edge, the weekly newsletter on innovation in and around higher ed. So glad to see people here today on the Zoom and in, in the conference here. Um, I'm delighted to be heading, running this panel. I, I just want to start this off at a kind of a high level. Um, and I'll ask, as, to, as we start this off, I'm going to ask all of you to introduce yourselves. Just, I, I mean, obviously, uh, Iris, you don't have to introduce yourself, introduce yourself because everyone's met you already. But as I'm just thinking about this conversation and this topic, and we're going to focus a lot more on policy, of course, um, I guess if, if you were designing a system, a system for providing workforce education money to colleges and community colleges, I'm guessing it wouldn't look a little like what the one we have today. <laughs> um, it might look a little differently. What, what, I mean, are there some simple things that you think would, would be a little different in the system if you could just design it from scratch? Oh, man. <laughs> Take it away, Amanda. So I'm just supposed to change, like, tell oh. you the whole new vision well, just two forward. just three but, things. Because okay. you know, like, you know, now it seems like square peg, round hole in a lot of cases. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, my name is Amanda Winters. I'm Program Director for Post-Secondary Education at the National Governors Association Center for Best Practices. So we are constantly thinking about state systems that serve these types of questions or challenges. Um, so certainly some of the things I would change or would want to address um, is right now we have a lot of bifurcated efforts, probably more than five, it's like tri and multi brocaded efforts. <laughs> um, around things like adult education, adult basic ed, which is over here and talks about its own things. We have career and technical education, which has its own bucket and planning processes. You have your eligible training provider lists and the processes that oversee those, which are murky at best. Um, and then you have the whole short-term Pell-related conversations. Um, so all of those conversations happen in different spaces. So if I were to make a change, um, the first change I would make would be systems connection. To, to combine all of those planning processes into one uh, and to start measuring some of those things. So if I was going to talk about initial changes, it would be changing what we measure and, and gather data on in states and requiring the interconnection and the strategy connection between what are very separate systems right now. Great. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Ji Heng Lee. I'm with the ACCT. Um, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I would say the thing that for, for community colleges, and I represent, uh, we're, we're obviously a membership association representing community colleges. What we have right now is we have these funding buckets, as Amanda just uh, uh, illustrated, where there are some small buckets, some larger buckets, and she actually you know, covered a large number of the Department of Education buckets. But we also have huge buckets, like in the Department of Labor, that we essentially, at the community college level, have to go fishing for. Some we get very little amount of money. Some we get some more money. Um, but at the end of the day, it's essentially a very shotgun approach to the process. We have institutions that, you know, I, I'm, I live in Northern Virginia Community College. And um, I was told that NOVA gets very, very small amounts of money for CTE programs at their community college. Like, so, such a little bit amount of money that they can barely fund an individual to do CTE just for the whole system of the community colleges. So you're talking 60, 70,000 students in their system and they're basically funding a half a person and some programs. Um, so if we want to do something that is meaningful, we need to concentrate efforts, especially at our community colleges, but also reprioritize what we want to do and start, I wouldn't say funnel is the right word, but prioritize those resources back down to our institutions as opposed to uh, what we currently are doing, which to me is a little too scattered and not focused enough to support our community colleges, which are basically everywhere and are very localized. Um, but that's probably where I would come down to, um, because we do have a very shotgun approach to our workforce adult basic education system, and it is not doing, uh, it's not doing enough uh, right now for our system of, of workforce development and higher, and higher education. 
And Iris, I know you, you just, just spent 15 minutes talking. <laughs> 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 we, weren't, we weren't here at all. But um, I guess I'm, I want to sort of shift to the next, uh, next big thought here. But I also want to mention that Alex Kemmer, um, Kemmerdell from the um, Joint Policy Center, who couldn't be here today, I spoke to him. He said he really wanted to make sure that as we're having these conversations, we, we think a lot more about the racial equity lens and also the outcomes lens, you know, echoing the conversation that we had in the first panel as well. Um, so please, let's all try to keep those thoughts in mind, and we'll try to channel him along the way. Um, we've just had an election, obviously, and we now know what the Senate looks like. We now what the state legislatures and the governor's, um, house, governor's houses look like. Given the current political landscape, I guess I'm wondering from um, each of you, a lot of the recommendations in this report require a lot more money. A lot of them require some policy changes. Some of them don't require direct any changes politically. But just wondering, what's the political environment now, you think? How positive, negative will it be towards some of the recommendations that have been laid out in some of these reports? You Iris, why don't you take start? that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a really, really good question. I think it's always obviously difficult to um, get more money, uh, but unfortunately, I think that it's really, really necessary uh, in this case. So even with the Democrats in control of the federal government, we went from an incredibly ambitious American Jobs, American Families plan to a slightly less ambitious Build Back Better plan that had, a, had quite a bit of money for workforce development at community colleges to base, I don't want to say nothing, there is some <laughs> money in like CHIPS and the Infrastructure Act and in, um, in the Inflation Reduction Act for training, but it is minimal. And so one thing I would just like to say is that it's not a guarantee that these issues will be a priority no matter who is in charge, but obviously um, politicians who are willing to spend more money is like a benefit to maybe creating more um, systemic and well-funded and well-run systems of supporting uh, workforce education, CTE education at community colleges. Um, so with our current political environment, I'm not sure, I mean, obviously, Ji Hang, you spend a lot more time on the Hill than I do um, for these issues, but I would say I'm not sure we'll see um, a, a significant additional investment in these programs um, for the foreseeable future. What I would hope we can see is additional money going towards the Strengthening Community Colleges grants at labor, maybe additional money for something like a tact investment. Um, I feel like those are, frankly, the least we can do to continue to strengthen these programs at the federal level. Um, and at the state level, it's just so diverse. I will allow Amanda well, I mean, to yeah. sort of pull that out. It yeah. definitely <laughs> depends on the politics of your particular state and what's going on there with the workforce because some states are feeling much stronger pinches of workforce issues than others and those states are actually I think doing a lot around um, administering changing the way they collect data the way that they fund the way that they think about these programs at the state level so I'll just leave it there and yeah allow and, you guys to yeah G hang on why don't you follow up on the federal level and then we'll come yeah. Down till you can explain 50 states to us in 20 in <laughs> seconds but uh, I mean this is always sort of um, portrayed as a much more bipartisan way, apart, yeah. more bipartisan than some, some funding for just you know, elite higher education. Um, but how, how strong does that bipartisanship go, you think, for not even just for the money, but even for some of these policy changes? Well, I think, uh, so I, yesterday I think that the, the was announced that the Republican Conference Committee uh, gave a waiver to Virginia Fox to continue to, uh, to serve as chairwoman of the Education and the, probably the Workforce Committee. Um, <laughs> that was a question mark. They'll probably change the name of the committee uh, in, when we start the 118th con uh, Congress. Um, and I think the big thing that uh, if you saw previously in, during the summer, they introduced a piece of legislation. Uh, the, the the ranking member uh, Fox, uh, they they outlined some provisions that they're interested in, and one area that's key to them is short-term Pell, uh, and so we're interested in seeing that type of policy shift. You know, the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act has always been pending and has been <laughs> pending for a long period of time. Since 2008. I, yeah, <laughs> you know, so, you know that was the last time we reauthorized it, so it's been pending since uh, 14. Is what we always like to say, uh, and I think that has by Bipartisan support. There is a piece of legislation, uh, you know, Portman and Cain bill, and the, the Competes Act passed out with a bipartisan uh, vote in, earlier this year in February, out of the House. So we we have hope that that will be a bipartisan vehicle, uh, whether or not this year or the forthcoming Congress. 
Uh, in terms of the funding vehicles, um, we do have some concerns that there might be some attrition on funding as you are already seeing it kind of percolate a little bit. Um, uh, with what do you mean in, by attrition? You, uh, you know, cutting a little bit uh, here yeah. and there. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you're, you, you know, you see kind of this conversation already um, uh, relative to uh, already setting some mile marks, so to speak, on the debt limits and other things about cutting some entitlement programs. So we are watching that, to, and hopefully these aren't things that will impact many of our higher education programs, like the Pell Grant program, uh, like the um, other higher education programs like Gear Up, uh, Trio, um, strengthening mm -hmm. institutions programs, and then will then ultimately impact like the strengthening community college program. Um, so we are trying to put some markers uh, for our institutions to, uh, to advocate for. And, and you know, many of our colleges will be coming to Washington, D.C. in February to do our legislative visits. Um, but so that's something that we are trying to do. But we do know that there are going to be some significant policy changes and bipartisan support. Uh, we just don't know on the funding side how that's going to be playing out. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was wondering, and I'm sorry, do you have any um, insight on the a possible omnibus versus CR and if there might be additional resources in that? Oh, we're really going deep down. Sorry, uh, <laughs> we are in DC. Uh, well, I, you know, I think, you know, there is a strong push to try to get an omnibus this year done prior to, you know, a CR is, you know, no one really loves a CR because CR just means everything is level funded, for, uh, and they'll be level funded to all the way to the next fiscal year, which is basically September 30th. So I think many people would prefer anomalous, uh, especially those individuals who are retiring. So one of those individuals that's retiring is the ranking member of the Senate uh, uh, help uh, the, the, the Appropriations Subcommittee on the <laughs> Health uh, Education Subcommittee. He has a lot of earmarks. Um, uh, community-based projects. This is that. actually just an incredible lesson because it's like we have this policy paper and three <laughs> years of research yeah. and, and so much deep thinking about expertise on the Hill and it's like some guys are going to retire and so yeah. that's going to affect what, what happens in Call the high policy yeah. windows. Gold well, you know, and it's, you know, this is how, you know, this is the perfect lesson in Washington, D.C. It's like this is how, you know, these things are made um, is that um, certain policy provisions and some things. This is how we make policy in Washington, D.C. This is how things are made. Uh, and so Senator Blunt's retiring. Uh, you know, Senator Shelby's retiring. So, you know, or, so these are things that we are watching. I don't know if Senator Shelby's retiring, but Senator uh, Blunt is retiring. And so he has a number of community-based projects that are being funded. Uh, I doubt he wants to lose those uh, as part of the process. So, so um, Amanda, it's so much more rational in the states, <laughs> I know. Right? Um, but, um, I mean, I, obviously we can't go by 50 states, but maybe what would be some of the factors, some of the principles, like conditions in certain states that might make this, some of these um, changes in state policy, some of the funding formulas that have been recommended m more or less likely over the next year? Yeah, and I think I, um, I have the great benefit of working with states and not having to worry that much about what happens at the federal level. Um, <clears throat> we implement stuff that happens at the federal level, but that doesn't stop us from doing stuff. States are still moving their work forward and are not waiting for Congress to do things, so, which is amazing. <laughs> and another thing that's also amazing is all the 55 governors of the states and territories would call themselves a workforce governor. And so the fact, it truly is a bipartisan topic. Certainly they approach it in different ways and there's different strategies that are um, being brought to bear for these things to happen in their states and there's different sectors that they're working on. But the conversation around workforce is a universal one. How can we get more people into jobs? How can we get more people off of public assistance? Which is great because that speaks to the equity conversation whether we call it equity or not. Mm -hmm. Getting people into good paying jobs. This is not this is not a, um, an, an issue that pushes governors apart. When they get in the rooms together, they're talking about these issues in a unified way. Um, and they're really thinking about their employer communities. <clears throat> they're thinking about how to serve them. They're thinking about how to best leverage their state and federal dollars to get this done. And I think one thing that we learned through 
all the COVID money flowing to states is that just chunks of money doesn't solve problems. It's not easy to spend money at a state level. Uh, it's complicated. It's complex. Uh, it's necessary to have strategy so you can't just push it out the door uh, in a couple months. So money itself doesn't solve the things that we're trying to solve. Certainly strategic investment um, in certain spaces can drive change. Um, but money itself is not the savior here. Um, we need to be thinking about how to better leverage our current systems. Again, I'll throw a foot stump on the data um, that we need that we don't have at the state or the federal level to make these kinds of decisions. Um, so what I do think is great is that we have the environment at the state level, no matter who's in the governor's chair, to talk about workforce in meaningful ways. And right now we're doing a lot of sector-specific conversations around workforce. Infrastructure bill certainly drove, has driven a lot of that. We're talking about transportation, we're talking about energy. Um, so we're talking about all of those um, pathways into good jobs. Uh, which we're super excited to help states on. We're also thinking a lot about the healthcare workforce with states, certainly com hopefully coming out of the pandemic. Um, we, are the, we have been decimated in our healthcare workforce space, and we need desperately to rebuild. Um, and so all governors are talking about that together. How are we going to make these changes? How are we going to move this needle? So while I think sector conversations are driving us right now, and some of those investments are really sort of spurring our thinking around this, it does connect to this non-degree pathway uh, as we're thinking about short-term pathways into these good jobs that then can take us into the future and prepare us for some of these infrastructure or cyber jobs or energy jobs that are emerging um, that people need to be adaptive for as they think about their career pathways. So I think we are in a, in a better space at the state level. I always think we're in a better space at the state level. So, yeah. um, But uh, because we're able to move, we're able to be more uh, responsive, we're able to leverage our community college systems um, and the work that they do without waiting for a federal move. And do you think it'll be really sort of e economically dri driven by the sort of needs of the economy even more so? I mean, not just we need to have better job training programs, but we need better job training programs in this sector, especially not necessarily this sector. Yeah, right now there's three sectors for almost every state when we talk to them. It's IT, it's health, and it's advanced manufacturing. Those are the three top ones. Certainly energy um, is an emerging one as we see some um, investments in that space and some real changes in the infrastructure conversation there. Um, but we're able to have conversations across these diverse economic spaces because the sectors are the same. That's right. They're the ones that are driving each of the needs of the workforce um, and sort of the emerging spaces in states. So we're able to talk across states about these things and those are the drivers of the workforce conversation. It's not necessarily jobs overall, but it's where do our employers where the pain points people. and affect the pain points exactly. to the previous conversation. Um, so I, we all had a chance to look at, our, at the report that Iris shared with us in advance, and I scoured it really carefully, and I never found the word Pell Grant in the report for short-term Pell. Um, <laughs> I was looking really hard, and it wasn't in there. Um, so, Iris, I know there was sort of a deliberate reason that you didn't put short-term Pell in there, but I want to hear from you quickly why, and then, Ji Hang, I think you had some thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> so thank you for asking, Goldie. Um, obviously, that is the, the elephant in the room. Um, so we... And I'll just actually just say me. I'll just say me. Um, <laughs> I believe that um, I love the Pell Grant program. I think it's a very effective, wonderful program. I hope we double Pell. I hope we do all the things with the Pell Grant program. But um, there's very little accountability around the Pell Grant program. And what we found from this research is that um, there are incredibly unequal outcomes for programs that are less than the current Pell minimum. Um, and unless there, are, I know that a lot of the proposals around short-term Pell um, are trying to address this by building additional, um, right, additional accountability into the, 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 the program. But um, I, frankly, having worked at the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education for three years and having studied um, Title IV for quite a while, I am skeptical that they can pull off um, some strong accountability measures in those programs. And what I fear is what we saw in 
HPOG or some of these other programs where you end up putting a whole bunch more money into short-term programs that get people really bad jobs. And I don't want that to happen. And while I think that non-degree programs are um, really important and can be really amazing and amazing um, pieces for economic mobility, they are not guaranteed to be that. And so um, that's why we des or I decided to um, increase funding for Title I in WIOA and go the WIOA route where we created additional training funding that hopefully would get at what we would get from um, short-term Pell, but do it with a lot more data and a lot more support for the capacity building at community colleges to assure that these are going, that people are going into really good jobs. I mean, it implies sort of a confidence that these other programs have, you know, all the WIA programs do have all this accountability measures attached to them. And, and there I'm are so problems sure with that. that. There are definitely <laughs> problems with that. But what I will say is there's data. There, at least there's something, whether it's great or not, and we can talk about that in minute detail if you'd like. But um, <laughs> I would just say, like, right now, we don't have anything coming out of Pell Grants. And I don't believe that there's necessarily the capacity at either colleges or the department to implement something coming out of Pell Grants. Whereas in WIOA and what we currently have, we have a structure around data reporting and data accountability that is at least there. So you could see what's happening to people going through shorter term programs and that they have an expectation that they will have a good job and that they will have a wage. And what we see in um, short term programs that aren't particularly high quality is that they tend to serve women, they tend to serve people of color, and they tend to put those people into jobs that are not necessarily family sustaining and don't necessarily have the kind of working conditions that we would want for them. So that was sort of um, my thinking around creating the sort of focus on WIOA at the federal level and leaving out sort of the Title I Pell conversation. Um, that, so there you go. Jihan, what did you think of that? <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about ACCT's perspective and community colleges. Obviously, from our perspective, we support short-term Pell um, as a uh, broader uh, policy provision. But we do know, uh, we, we acknowledge Iris's perspective. Uh, Mary Alice, Amy, if you're watching, uh, uh, if, I'm sure you are. Um, we acknowledge all of these uh, uh, policy uh, arguments, and I think you know from our standpoint and the consumer advocates. Um, and so, you know, a couple of the things that we have started to have conversations around, especially, and you saw that in the kind of the competes act uh, conversation. Uh, is one, we know that whenever we do a short-term PAL uh, rollout, let's say, that not all of the short-term programs will be eligible for short-term PAL. It will be a small subset of programs with a broader ramp up. Uh, that's number one. Number two, wages will be a strong part of the conversation about the eligibility for these programs. Um, we do not, uh, from our community college sector, do not want to offer programs that don't provide a sustaining wage to these individuals. Um, and that's kind of the conversation that I have globally, uh, regardless of the short-term programs. Uh, because what I can tell you right now is where, you know, I was in Iowa driving through the cornfields of Iowa to a conference and you can go to a McDonald's, stop on the way, $15 an hour starting salary with benefits. So I go to our conference and, uh, there and say, how many of your programs have a minimum starting wage of $15 an hour with benefits? That's the conversation we are having with our members. So that's the same conversation around short-term Pell. So we do know data is going to be important. Wages are going to be important. Uh, and you know the other guardrail that we, was included was that we did not want to have these students take out loans. So institutions would have to provide some additional wraparound services as part of these short-term programs. And then the other guardrail that was included uh, as part of the competes so would it would be only open to uh, nonprofit institutions of higher education. So I think from the community college perspective, we try to create as many guardrails to be as responsive to the uh, consumer advocates as possible uh, so that we can at least initially get some uh, data that showcases that many of these programs can lead to sustaining wages. Um, uh, but we do know 
And, uh, you know, Iris is right. There are programs that won't lead to X. Uh, you know, they just, they won't be able to be eligible for short-term PAL. Uh, we, we, we realize that, and so we, we'll, we won't offer those programs or try to get eligibility for those programs. Uh, yeah, Amanda, in the states, I mean, I know obviously states have a lot of money going toward workforce things, but it's not necessarily coming out of their educational grant programs, right? It's, you know, aren't that many Cal grants, you can't use Cal grants for a lot of these kinds of programs or New York SUNY, um, you know, New York State PAG money or that, right? Yeah, so it comes from different spaces uh, within states. Some states are a little bit more innovative with their funds um, and pull them from some different places to support some of these programs. Again, many are sector specific, so that money flows through specific places. But I do think to, to speak to what's already been said around sort of some of the guardrails, um, it's what states are struggling with, and we're working with several of them right now, thinking about sort of skills for, you know, adaptive skills for new, the, the new emerging economy, um, is what is good when it comes to the, you know, these short-term credentials? What is going to be valued? Um, and so there is a, whatever you might say about some outcomes about degrees, associate's degrees or bachelor's degrees, there is an assumption that employers will make if you come with a degree. Um, when you come with a short-term credential or a non-degree credential or a non-credit credential, which can be two different things, again, <laughs> all right. different things. They could all be the same. <laughs> right? Um, we don't know what employers value. Um, and so there's that, what should we invest in? because we need to know if it's gonna be valued on the other end. And I think what complicates this, and I always try to throw this in when we're talking about sort of like colleges working with employers, is that employers don't speak with one voice either. Sometimes we act like, oh, we need to be responding to the needs of employers, and employers tell us what, they, it's not like there's one clear voice <laughs> saying this is what we need. It's every employer telling us what they need, and certainly community colleges are at the hub of that having all their employers say, here's all the different things we need. And we don't value that credential, we value this industry credential. And so how are we gonna decide on investment? And I think that really complicates the state picture around workforce education. I'm gonna enlist, because it's not just WIOA. Right. It's small w workforce. It's thinking about a whole workforce pipeline. Um, and so sometimes that can get muddled too, because then people think we're just talking about WIOA programs. But really thinking about building a workforce and the fact that we're trying to respond to the needs, all, the needs of all the employers at the same time. And there's a back and forth that many times doesn't happen around valuing. And so when you do these shorter term credentials, one of the possible pitfalls is a bunch of employers won't value this when they get out there. How are we communicating the value? And then you've just invested a lot of money in something that nobody wants. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, I think, what states are trying to avoid, but they're struggling with some of the same questions that were just brought up. Some of the models that are described in the program, in the, in the report that um, we sh Ira shared with us and that you'll all be reading soon, um, <laughs> they talked about, you know, models, you know, some, some colleges are offering a lot of free training, you know, because, because there's these funding streams that are coming through or they're pretty affordable or pretty low cost. But I guess I was wondering about free. Like, in this, in this market, is free always the best thing? Is free necessary to get people into these programs or... Should these programs have some other kinds of price tags and some, you know, as you're thinking about this from a policy perspective, you know, what, what seems to work best? You want to jump in from the community college perspective? Oh, this is a great topic of conversation. <laughs> um, so uh, I, am, I am always of the perspective, and, you know, you saw this from the GAO report around, uh, that just came out two days ago, I guess, uh, earlier this week around uh, uh, financial offer letters. The lack of transparency. Lack well, yeah, of transparency. Yeah, let's be clear. Yeah. Here, here's, here's the thing. Free denotes something, OK? It provides a, a, a dollar amount. You know, California, where I was uh, raised uh, and uh, went to you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, but I didn't go to college in California. They've long had something called the Board of Governors uh, Fee Waiver. It's called the Bog Waiver. Basically, if you're a middle-income individual, you would get your fee waiver and you would go for free. But they never called it free community college. They would call it a bog fee waiver. <laughs> so when you did your, when you would apply for federal financial aid and you go through their system, they would tell you you got a bog fee waiver. Okay, that was their board of governors fee waiver. So when they would 
when you as a college president or one of my trustees would go, you would say, oh, you might be eligible for a BOG fee waiver. That's a horrible message for a family <laughs> on it when you're doing a back to school night talking about the opportunity to go to college. Why can't we just say you're going to go to college for free at a community college? Why can't we just say that? What, you know, why do we make it so hard for individuals to think about college? Um, and I, th you know, I think about the, you know, the financial offer letters and other things like that. We make college too difficult to aspire to. And so for me, free denotes something. Uh -huh. it, it's an entry point. And if you want to set a dollar level and say, if you're a family of four making $200,000 or below, you go for free. Easy as pie. Everybody can understand that. And you think that applies in the non-credit field, in the short-term training, everywhere? Every it, it probably even, it, it's even more important for that group, subset of individuals. Uh, because they're, they're the, you know, for the most part, they're probably, they don't have somebody to lean on. Their parents probably don't have a baccalaureate degree or somebody they can go to and say, can you read this financial offer letter or to figure out what this means to me? Um, because we're always leaning on the person who, you know, I had to lean on my sister. And I thank God, I don't even know who my sister leaned on to read my offer letter. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, these are things that we always lean on the next person. And who do these individuals lean on to read these letters uh, when they don't ex actually know what's in them? So what if we end this room like three years yeah. ago talking yeah, 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 about yeah, financial yeah, yeah, offer yeah. letters? Yes, yes. Okay, shout out to Renee. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can take that one for like, <laughs> everyone, I was just, probably everybody in this room has written something about financial aid letters at this point. Um, from the state level though, politically, the, do programs, sh is free better or is something of where people are saying, you, you pay us a nominal amount or, you know, the state's investing, you're investing? I mean, There's a mix of approaches. First of all, there's quite a few states that think, you know, students need skin in the game in order to find value in what they're getting otherwise for free. Even if it might be refundable later or something. Yeah. It, or, like, you need to stay and work here in the state. Like, there's, there's a lot of legislatures and states that are thinking about different ways in which to approach getting people affordable pathways um, into college. And then also, one of the things I just have to acknowledge that we're fighting against right now in the political spectrum, I mentioned that all these governors are workforce governors, but we're <laughs> fighting against the conversation around the ROI of college. Um, of course, I, I think there's a good ROI for college. I'm a program director for post-secondary education, so right. I want people to go to college. But I feel like this, when we're, especially when we're talking, uh, bringing in Alex's comments at the beginning, when we're thinking about the equity piece here, one of the things I think I'm certainly trying to avoid as I work with states on some of these shorter term options is making sure that we don't create alternatives for some. Um, and then all the people who were going to go to college in the normal traditional sense will continue to do that and have that path for them. And then we create alternative pathways that, we, that are then sort of like marked as like, well, you didn't go to college. You took the skills route, or you took the this kind of different route, making it separate in the way we talk about it at the state level, the way we measure it, the way we uh, message it to employers. There's a lot of possible pitfalls as we move in this direction of creating a separate system for those people who are not meant for college, or not everybody needs to go to college. I feel like it's, that's dangerous rhetoric. I feel like they, everybody should have the opportunity to do whatever the heck they want. <laughs> and if they decide not to go to college, totally fine. Um, but also, I think some of the rhetoric, too, is some of this is college work. But we just don't call it college because it's not a degree pathway. Certainly, community colleges sit at that hub. They do a lot of work that's post-secondary, and it's strong and has great outcomes for students. But we don't call it college, even though it's administered by our community colleges. And we even had to change where I sit now. I changed the name of my team from higher education to post-secondary. And the reason was I heard from a governor's education policy advisor, oh, we don't work on higher education. We work with our community colleges. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what to tell you. OK, little, 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 little reality. Right there. Like, and so just even those words that separate you know, the alternative 
and the higher education and these different, I think I'm, I'm struggling to cut those out of the way I talk about some of these pathways um, so that we're thinking about it in a unified sense around sort of all pathways lead to opportunity in the post-secondary space um, and we're not bifurcating like the alternative and then everybody else gets, you know, the regular people go here and then the alternatives go here. Um, so I do think that that's, uh, when we're talking about sort of the funding of college, there's a struggle there between the desire to get people quickly into jobs and possibly creating this alternative pathway that gets funded. And then the conversation around the ROI of actual college degrees that in the political sphere just creates a tension around where money is flowing, where attention is given from um, state policymakers, and sort of what their approach is to funding these pathways, whether they're funding degrees or they're funding these shorter term immediate work. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about this whole, the no, what about these funding formulas, because that's a big piece of the report as well. Talks a little bit about, you know, maybe different approaches that aren't just about contact hours, different approaches that are more about maybe even outcomes funding. Um, do you see some possibilities, um, particularly, um, Iris, obviously you've identified a few in the report, but Jane and Amanda, are there some places where you could see more states wanting to do a funding formula that was maybe even, and back to Alex's point, maybe even outcome funded funding formulas where it's not just about you producing these programs, but you're producing programs and they have, you know, they show these results. Are states in the position to do that? Oh, I can start. Certainly. Yeah. There are certainly some states that are thinking right now about integrating workforce, workforce focused programs into their outcomes based funding models. We're very excited to Even see. Even for, no, for non degree? Yes. Yes. And so, um, again, non degree, not non credit. Different? So, yes. <laughs> yeah. I had to throw that in there. Even though there are some states that are starting to pilot um, gathering some information around non credit yeah. programs. Yeah. Louisiana. But, um, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about that non-degree, there are certainly some states who are thinking about integrating those into uh, their outcomes-based funding formulas. Excited to see that kind of information gathering and that outcomes, pointing to those outcomes um, being a part of state data systems. One of the things I just heard from the Community College Research Center recently is that some of these shorter term credentials that have shown to have great benefit are people who are reskilling. And so then that's, a data point that we need to consider too. People who might already have a degree um, who are taking some additional training to shift and go into a new space. So we need to understand entry points and transition points and including these in outcomes measures I think are going to be super valuable. So we are seeing some desire to do that. Um, full implementation will be exciting in those states so that we can learn from that, but Jihang, certainly community colleges. Do you hang on that? I mean, that sounds great on paper, but the reality is trying to, you know, develop those kinds of outcome measures for colleges is going to be really hard and very cumbersome and can, I mean, so the funding <laughs> formula could show up, but then suddenly the colleges have to sort of, you know, come up with all this data and, you know, monitoring. Is it doable? Uh, some states are better than others uh, is always a good uh, is always a good <laughs> mantra that I always have. Uh, they're uh, all equal. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, uh, data, data, data systems, okay. data, data systems. You know, but so, some of this is going to come back to the colleges themselves. Too. Correct, and you know, obviously, some of our ruler institutions that are have you know their IT director is their IR director. You know, it's it, it, there. It's it's a lot of work to data crunch on some of this stuff, but you know, I think. What Amanda just denoted is we have system a system of higher education where we have entry points of individuals that are high school graduates, high school dropouts, baccalaureate degree individuals, complete, we have master's degree individuals. They're all coming back to their community colleges at some point in time to get extra credentials, skills-based learning, other things. Uh, refresher course, we have people coming for, and so, at some point in time, we have to still track. We're tracking them because we're trying to get credit so that we get funded from the states. So we are doing that, but we're not necessarily able to track them post-level, um, uh, and especially if they leave the state. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, we do need better data systems, especially at the federal level, so we can get credit and see how well they're doing. 
Uh, and so, you know, some level of transparency relative to earnings would be helpful for us um, to see how well the, uh, those individuals are doing post uh, our community college. So, so you're thinking even if, if there were these kinds of outcomes measured funding at states, you're not, you're thinking that the measurement would have to come from the state level, it couldn't come from the colleges themselves? It would have to probably come from the, it, m most of this comes from a statewide data system, either through their state uh, Department of Taxation mm -hmm. or somewhere else. It, it go, it's a level b above uh, the community college. And just to clarify, there are many states that already do this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I think the um, evidence on what the impact is is mixed. Um, mm -hmm. But what I was really excited about was integrating the workforce programs um, more thoroughly into this and understanding how those function. Because we do see some of these systems that actually prioritize transfer. And like transfer is great, and they should definitely get bonuses for transfer. But making sure that um, states are thinking through what they need out of their workforce and how they're going to create um, incentives for community colleges to do more of this and give them actually more resources to do it well um, is something I'm really happy to hear, Amanda, that, that states are thinking about more thoroughly. Because they've generally thought about outcomes-based funding in the context of traditional academic programming, I would say. Yep. Yeah. Primarily academic, yeah. Right. I want to make sure we come back to the data question before we conclude this conversation because I have my few questions of it myself. I mean, I also want to get folks in the room ready if you want to, um, anyone here has a question or um, people online who want to submit one to do so now. Um, but just quick, one quick question about this sectoral partnerships. That's a big emphasis of the conversation in the report, big emphasis in the previous conversation um, that Paul uh, led. Um, uh, how, I mean, obviously, employers, you know, you, I think in, in some cases, employers might want to do this, but not every, in, not every sector of the country kind of has like a big industry sector right there. So how do you do sectoral pol um, partnerships in places where you don't necessarily have a big industry, but maybe there are some common skills that are needed across industries? And like, are there ways that um, colleges or the states could sort of incentivize this at all? Oh, Amanda, you need to start. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, it wasn't jumping in too quick. Okay, I can start it now. Um, yeah, certainly um, regional conversations of, is like regional collaborations have been incentivized by the state, by states uh, to do a lot of this work. Certainly one of the things we're seeing as a driving factor here is like IT. IT is not a standalone. Every, everybody is IT. Um, IT lives everywhere. That's part of the problem of getting data about our IT sector, is because mm -hmm. IT lives in every space that we have now. Um, so thinking about some of those transferable skills, like in IT, that applies to all of the businesses within your region, um, and how can we prepare a workforce for this? Part of the thing um, that we're bumping up against, certainly in any of these regional conversations, is proprietary training information from uh, employers who want to engage, they want a workforce, and so we're like, okay, so what do you need? Uh, what are the skills that you need? And they're like, mm. <laughs> just guess. <laughs> and then we will tell you that you are wrong. Um, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't be so mean about employers. Um, uh, but it's a struggle because there's proprietary information layered in there, and they are competing with each other. When you have a sectoral approach, you're getting a bunch of competitors together and trying to think about the whole workforce pipeline together. And that's not easy to do. And another thing that's not easy to do there is that you need an intermediary to do that. Um, it's hard for states to come in and do that. States are very compliance driven, very consumer protection driven, um, and then they're connected to like funding streams. And so it's hard for them to Plus be they're able the to, government. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we are here to help. Um, but, but we're thinking like who can bring people together as a neutral convener, whereas the government is not a neutral convener here. Um, and so that takes money, that takes time, takes investment, and that takes a willingness of people to come to the table. And that varies in different regions. So I think there are quite a few states who are trying to fund intermediaries to do some of this work um, within certain regions of the states. I mentioned healthcare before as a big priority area. That's been a driver of some regional collaboratives over the past couple of years, certainly because of the public health crisis. Um, but then also just thinking about, we, look, we're losing so many direct care workers. We needed to work together. Um, it was a crisis that brought things together. But we learned a lot, I think, um, from some of those COVID-era collaborations about how to sort of let go a little bit 
and say, we, we just need it. We're in desperate need. But we need to figure out how to manage some of these aside from a desperate need, an emergency need. Um, but I think we have a lot of states that are doing some great things. Um, and certainly community colleges and regional universities um, are at the hub of some of this work. I don't want to forget the regional universities in this. I feel like we forget them a lot uh, when we're talking about uh, systems of post-secondary education in states. They usually have very close ties to their community colleges in the way of transfer and articulation and many times are an economic driver themselves, like community colleges. They're anchor institutions within rural regions. They might be the biggest employer. Um, so thinking about them as an employer and as a facilitator of training for a talent pipeline, they really can have a really strong voice in regional conversations around talent pipelines. So since you mentioned talent pipelines, obviously um, the Chamber of Commerce has been making a very big effort around the country to do this thing as well, um, and organizations like Futuro Health and the like. Um, Ji Hang, from the college's perspective, I mean, I, there could be so many people to talk to. You know, at some point it maybe becomes a little bit overwhelming because you know you don't want to talk to individual employers. There might not be the right industry thing. Do, is it frustrating for the community colleges to try to develop these sectoral pop, um, partnerships when you don't even know who the sector is? Um, you know, I think for community colleges, they're very open to doing any type of partnerships with entities that have some relative scale to them. Uh, and so whether or not it's an advisory board uh, for a sector or an entity, you know, a group of uh, businesses, they're always willing to do that work. And so a vice president of workforce uh, might be leading that conversation and they'll be doing visits. I think the one thing that's sometimes difficult for many of our community colleges, and I'm thinking of a couple of examples, is like for an example, a business might come to our community college and say, I need a program for X, and I would like you to create it. Um, and they will be like, so how long of a program yeah. would you like this for? And they're like, two years. I only need 20 people. <laughs> so scale is a problem for many of our community colleges. We're not going to just create a program that fills 20 seats uh, and that ultimately closes down within two years. Right. You know when. Boeing moved from Washington State to South Carolina, outside into Charleston, you're talking about a long-term relationship. Systemic change for Triton Technical College's programming that's state-funded, like years and years of, pro of additional work, like colleges are ready to do that work. They're not necessarily, they're not, they don't love a, you know, 20 people and we're done type of relationship. So I think those are the things, the one-offs are the ones that are really difficult for our colleges and they're just gonna have to make a decision and sometimes the, 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 answers, be, the answer's gonna be no. no. Yeah. And, and <laughs> that's hard to say, um, but it's also, you know, some of the college presidents and the vice presidents have to make that decision. Um, but if there is growth opportunity, I think that is something that our colleges, you know, but if you go out to, for an example, if you ever go to Manassas, for example, and you drive around, there are every big building that you see is a server farm mm -hmm. in Manassas, Virginia. And many of those individuals that are working in those server farms, many of them come from Nova. So like for us, that there's a scalability for our programming, for our community college. Now, if there was only one server farm, I don't know if Nova would have been able to do that, right. but like, what, if there's growth opportunity, our colleges are, are are able to be supportive of those opportunities. So can I add a couple examples? I know you want to move on. I yeah. want to get to the question okay. in a second, but go ahead. Um, I well, just want to say um, when we talked to colleges, we heard like a lot of this, and one of the things was like, oh, my employers come to me and they want like a vet tech, and that's a really expensive program, <laughs> and like a vet tech is not going to do it. So we did hear a lot about that. Um, HVAC actually, some of these others, like they actually would run the program every other year because that's what the demand would support. And then we also heard about consortial models because every um, rural college need or rural areas need like healthcare workers and respiratory therapists and things like that, but they don't need a million of them. So how do you aggregate the demand to be able to offer these programs in a way that helps people grow the talent that are local to their own community, but also you're not graduating a whole bunch of people who then there's no demand for in the area. So it is quite a challenge to balance the two things. Um, 
but yeah, yeah. anyway, just wanted to add And then there's the employer commitment. I just want to add a postscript to the comment that Paul made for the first panel. That CoLab project that I've written about, which created these sort of data skills um, uh, certificates for, that the universities and colleges all around the, this region were offering, that program was developed with, with cooperation from a lot of employers. There was a lot of input. But ultimately, there was no input later. The employer sort of backed away afterwards when it came to hiring the people with, the, with their certificate. So you need the employer's commitment at the front end and then probably at the back end, too, to know that they're actually still going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, is there anybody in the room who has a question? Come to the mic real quick and do that. I see someone getting up to the mic. Yay. We have a live question <laughs> in a live event with the live people in the event. When there's one on here, too. <laughs> uh, fascinating conversation. Thanks. Um, some of the comments have gotten at this a little bit, but I'm curious, reflecting on the last few years, we've seen uh, both the economy and education delivery shift quite a bit in that people growing appetite to both learn online and also to find jobs that may not be in your regional labor market. I do feel like a lot of the discourse around these issues, though, one, like exclusively has the regional labor market frame being the one and only way we think about demand. Um, and then curious as well as community colleges think about scaling their, their non-degree program, the role that online is going to play in some of those offerings. Um, how do you think about like these developments? Have they changed anything that you're thinking about policy as, as we move forward? Um, as we think about quality, it may be that the best quality programs are not in your local labor market. Um, what do you think this should mean for how we think about both federal and state policy? Hmm. I have some thoughts. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Go, Amanda. Mm. Um, yes. So um, certainly there's a lot of governors who are thinking about trying to attract talent who don't, who hadn't lived in their state or the jobs aren't in there. So say, hey, come here. Like uh, West Virginia did this program. Like all the teleworkers, come here and live. Um, and it sounds like kind of a cool <laughs> program. Um, and quite, I know some people who actually moved to West Virginia during that time frame because they gave them like $13,000 to move to the state. And they promised them broadband and all of these different things. Um, and so some states are thinking about, especially those with um, large rural areas or aging populations. They're really thinking about getting people in to revitalize um, some of their uh, areas. So I think there's some states that are thinking really creatively about the workforce and the fact that not all the jobs are going to be right there in the region, but you can still sort of grow economies by being responsive to that. So that's certainly one of the spaces. But I think another space that states are thinking about now, which I think is critical, is digital equity. So if we are, in fact, moving to online as a primary uh, source of, of where we get our education, which I will say, online learning is not easy. I used to like, work with online programs with students. You have to be, be self-motivated. And like a, you have to be a self, I wouldn't be able to do it. <laughs> Um, because you have to be like, well, no, I have to get on and do all my work um, without somebody making me come to a classroom and do those kinds of things. It's, it's challenging. Not everybody can do it. I think we should assume that everybody likes it either. Um, just because people are younger doesn't mean they don't want to be around people in the classroom. So I do think that there's that challenge of saying not everything's going to be online, but online is here to stay. Um, and so I think digital equity is a huge piece here, if we're actually trying to reach people who have, not, who have been disconnected from our education and workforce systems, we have to think about creating the bridge that the Digital Equity Act is trying to address within the infrastructure bill. And some of their priority populations, I think, are fascinating. And I love kind of where they went with that. So you certainly got rural populations, people with disabilities, incarcerated individuals, especially as we see Pell coming back um, in 2023 for, um, for people in prison. So I think that gap will need to be filled if we're actually going to see growth in opportunity um, in our education and workforce space, is making sure people have access and know how to utilize it. And um, we had some Band-Aids during the pandemic for people to get access to computers. Um, some of these could turn into long-term solutions. So we need to see that change happen. So I do think we need, to, we need to think about online as an important element of the ecosystem creative ways to think about addressing the, the way the economy is moving now with a lot of teleworking, a lot of people not having to move to get that good job. Uh, and then the digital equity piece is filling that gap. So I think states are trying to address all of those in different spaces within their policy work, but those will be key going forward. 
Can I just add, um, I think it really depends on the occupation. And a lot of the occupations yeah. that um, you, where you get a um, good job with not, without a college degree, associates or bachelors, are very hands-on occupations. So we talked about skilled trades, we've talked about advanced manufacturing, we've talked about healthcare, which, you know, maybe some of those jobs are better than others. Um, I think that there are like IT opportunities maybe for more um, uh, remote work and for programs that are more online, but that is absolutely not universal. And when we, during COVID, when we talked to colleges with lots of CTE hands-on training, it was incredibly negatively impacted by COVID to the point of like they were having to send people in their automotive programs to like local employers to learn. They were doing all kinds of things, none of which were ideal um, to, to create training that was more virtual than um, they'd, they'd been doing before. Um, and I would not say it's something that they're necessarily going to continue to do. So I just always think it's important to keep in mind that many of these programs are very hands-on. And while maybe there's a component of it that can go online with healthcare programs, for instance, there will always be that clinical experience and that hands-on experience. And so you need access to that um, wherever you live. Yeah, and I would just uh, say that you, you asked about like the regional uh, labor market and stuff. You know, for us at the community college level, since especially, you know, I, you know, I represent boards, you know, our boards are either appointed or elected, you know, for the most part locally. We're very responsive to the needs of our employers and our communities locally, um, except for my state boards. Um, and so from that point of perspective, uh, we're always going to be attuned to those regional needs first and foremost. Uh, so I don't think we're going to be changing that type of model. Obviously, we're always going to be looking to attract and you know, poach, I guess, a good way to, <laughs> yeah, for those governors who are poaching. Um, but you know, the, these are things that we're, we are definitely attuned to watching. Um, but, you know, but I would also just uh, agree with Iris, some of our programs, while we might have VR and simulations well, from welding to painting to uh, uh, you know, some other programs, you, you're going to have to have some real life experience. Um, uh, you know, I've done a, a welding uh, a simulation. It's not, it's fine, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's fine except you don't for, know how to weld yet. Uh, well, it's, it's fine and all, but except you need to smell the burning thing, right? Like there are some <laughs> elements to welding that you're going to have to experience on a, you know, real life experience. Uh, and so, you know, there's elements to the skills trades that you're just going to have to experience in real life. Right. Um, I just want to bring up one note from the a, a listener from all, um, wrote in more of a comment that just says the application process for WIOA needs to be addressed. It's a problem. Individuals, it's it pretty difficult for individuals to apply for services. So that's yeah. sort of an underlying problem with you know, an underlying issue that I think. I mean, in addition to the fact that a lot of these programs are in a lot of different buckets, and Ji Hang says you have to go fishing to catch them from the college's perspective, it's also complicated for the individuals in many cases to try to get them. And there is no like unified WIOA or like right. unified way that anyone's doing this, so you could get into real deep, complicated questions, which I glossed over in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> which gets me to the thing that I want to sort of sum up with here, and I appreciate everyone, everyone's patience today. But I mean, the, Iris, you put a lot of emphasis on you know the need for more data and more data infrastructure. But I guess I still really wonder who uses this data and how are they using it? I mean, are people really out there? Like somebody who's looking for a job training program and they just want a different career. I mean, are they going to really go to some website, some arcane website, and look up the information and, you know, oh, this, is, this career is better because it has this better wage outcome three years later? I mean, I know there's a lot of attention to data, but in the end, I mean, from all three of you, if you could just sort of sum up, like, what's realistic about using data going forward and what's kind of you know, more of just data for data's sake. So two pieces that I'll just say and then let my colleagues comment. One, I think that for this population, they really want the answer to what kind of wage can I expect and what kind of job would I be able to get. And whether or not they're going to go to a website for that is sort of maybe not, but the college needs to be able to answer that question. And they need to be able to answer it clearly for this population. Um, and I just think that's true. Um, I think it does influence where people go for this uh, this type of program. Policymakers want to be able to see it because they want to be able to be they want to be able to create incentives and structures that 
support the programs that help their economy and their, their state, they may not get deeply into the data, but they want that number so they can say, look, this is what's happening. Um, so like, if it just lives on a website somewhere, probably not. You need to be able to tell a story with it and you need to be able to present it in a way that helps people understand what it is and contextualizes it. On the program development and improvement um, level, I would say those people need so much help um, understanding how to use data. Um, the California's Launch Board um, work that they did on this, they just spent years working with faculty, administrators, people at the institutions to understand, A, this data is correct, like it's not your anecdotal evidence, but like this is actually what's happening, and B, like here's what you should do about it. Like here's the, here are the types of metrics you could be looking at, here's the structures you should be looking at. They'd go and they'd be, these people would say, oh, you don't have enough measures, and then they would go back and like consolidate their measures or they give more measures and then they come back, you have too many measures, right? So it would just be like back and forth on that. So there needs to be some real training for the people in these, and, and incentives for people at the colleges to actually use the data to improve their programs. So that is that these programs are data driven at the outset. Right. Here's the thing. Our students, especially on this non-credit, non-degree side, they are looking for positions, occupations, at the end of the day, and they are looking at wages and earnings of some sort. And so they're picking, uh, I like to use my hands, I want to be doing this, I might be, a, uh, I might be an introvert, so I want something that's more away from people. And they're looking at wages to try to figure out their next job. And so we need to provide that information. And I think that's going to be very important. We make these decisions every day. When you go to a grocery store, you look at costs. You look at the, all the costs relative to the X spaghetti box versus that spaghetti box. Like, our, our individuals are making the same decision. And so we need to have some type of data set beyond just some anecdotal information. So we, for the most part, um, many of our colleges use regional BLS data. It's not the best data. Um, so if we can get some additional data that kind of denotes what's happening, that would be even better for us. Um, so we could use better data because our students are asking us for that data. And um, the days of we don't need the data are long gone because really at the end of the day, most families are asking if I take this position or this program, what will I earn in two or three years' time? That's the reality. And it's, you know, and candidly, for all the people who are not in the community college sector, it's the same Probably question. Right it's the same <laughs> question if I go to UC Berkeley or I go to Stanford, if I take X program and graduate with a political science degree, how much am I earning in two or three years' time? It's the same question that's coming for all of you. Um, you know, and uh, just a shout out to Rachel on the varying degrees, uh, 2022. I encourage you to take a look at the return on investment charts uh, versus by demographic, uh, by millennials, Gen Z, the silent generation. You take a look on the ROI, the older you are, the more broadly you think that there's a return on investment in higher education. <laughs> The younger you are, you think there's, a, there's not a return on investment in higher education. And that's a big problem. And um, you know, part of this puzzle is we need to provide this data because that next gener the next generations, that's the generation that doesn't believe that there's a return on investment in higher education. All right, Amanda, bring it on home. What All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think what's been brought up here by Iris and Jihang is that there are different audiences for the data that we want to collect. And there's different needs that exist there. Certainly for the students, there's very specific information that we want to be giving to these learners to say, these are your options, this is the results that they can get you. And then when you're talking about policymakers, there needs to be a better understanding of the questions they want to ask of their data systems. They don't need to know how all the data systems work. It gets very complicated very quickly. But like for a governor's office, my first question when they're talking about data is, what do you want to know mm -hmm. from your systems? Um, and then ask your people, can I answer this question? And if not, what's missing? And that's where you think about metrics, is adding, not starting from what are all our, you know, let's get deep into the weeds here, 
but asking like, what, what information do I need? And can I get that with our current data? And if not, then let's make some changes. Uh, but there is a tendency at the state level to just add a bunch of metrics to things um, to make data more compliance focused than strategy focused. Um, and I think that's where there's with states who are really trying to utilize their data uh, in good ways, that's where you see the difference. And I will say one of the, the pitfalls has been um, when states try to disaggregate some data and then don't do anything with those outcomes. They'll have a report and they'll be like, we have very bad outcomes for these students. That is bad. And then they will, <laughs> that will go on a website and nothing else happens with it. Um, so data needs to spur change or it's useless. Um, so I think we need to think about, as we're thinking about recommendations around data, specifically for each of these different types of populations, where does this data need to live? Learners and workers, for them, we need to get this information in the hands of advisors and counselors and folks at the K-12 space, um, folks in our one-stops, people at our community colleges, arming the people with data that need to be talking to these students. And that's where that flow of that information needs to happen because those are the people connecting with students to talk about their options. So it doesn't just live dead on a website. But then policymakers, there's very specific ways in which they need to interact with our data. Uh, and we need to better understand, as Iris said, that data for storytelling and for case making uh, around access and opportunity. So when we're thinking about data, I'm really trying to think about it as in who are our populations who need this data um, and what frame does this need to take? So what does that teach us about what changes we need to make to our data system? So it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced issue. Well said. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And to take it to the next point, of that, which not data for data's sake, but data to then right. Our, Leverage some change. Great. Yep. Um, I think our time for this panel is done. Yep, is there yep. more programs?